and they want to talk to us about money. So this will be much more interesting than it was this morning. Uh, so uh, Melissa Tesh um, is the general manager for uh, SIR and she's been working with uh, them since 2010 and, uh, uh, sorry, 2014 and uh, has uh, a bachelor degree in science and uh, education and a master's degree in biology. Alan Nielsen uh, is uh, the, I guess, the CEO of uh, Nielsen Strategies. And uh, Alan's been around the area for a long, long time, has done a lot of studies uh, for most local governments in the area and regional districts. Uh, very experienced in service reviews, uh, mostly working with the North Okanagan. Um, but uh, has uh, also participated, I think it was very involved in the incorporation of uh, uh, West Kelowna. So uh, they uh, notified us uh, a while ago now about a challenge that came in from North Okanagan on the cost allocation of the SIR program. And they established a working group and uh, their board of directors has now come up with a recommendation that will be coming to us on November 19th. So today, again, uh, because we're not in a meeting, uh, is for information and uh, they'll take questions and defend, uh, I'm sure, the board's decision, uh, the SIR board's decision on how they want to proceed. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Melissa and Alan and uh, they can introduce uh, their program. How's that? There we go. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson, and, and uh, to the board for having us today. Um, I'll start with those thank yous, and of course, I'd like to thank Director Bush for, uh, he's been participating on our board for as long as I've been involved with the program. Uh, but at this particular time, we also really need to say, you know, thank you to Mr. Newell and Mr. Savino for their work on this file that we're bringing to you. And in particular, thank you for giving us the time to come here because it would be difficult to talk about this whole subject in a 10 minute delegation. So I don't want to take advantage of that time. Um, I didn't prepare the sort of usual rah-rah SIR presentation. <laughs> I always have it in my back pocket if I need to pull it out. Um, but I'm going to sort of start with a, a two minute highlight reel of the program where we are, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Nielsen, and actually Alan has been working with the SIR program specifically since I was going after that first degree you mentioned, so <laughs> quite a while, and he's been um, the go-to for everything legislative for the program. It's been very nice to have somebody with such a long history and to understand that this isn't the first time we've been through it. So very quickly on the SIR program. Um, this year we are uh, again meeting our operational target. We set a very high target for the program, which is less than 0.2% damage from coddling moth um, in the fruit at time of harvest. So that is less than one damaged apple for every 500 fruit that the growers harvest. Uh, it seems like a razor thin margin and certainly your homeowner doesn't need that level but to make money on apples that's the kind of damage target you're looking at and if you've read the local news at all you'll know that even meeting that target growers are having a tough time making a go right now. So we are meeting that operational target. Um, we are the envy of apple growing regions around the world and I've been saying this since I started with the program. And that's all well and good to say that we're the envy, but we've been able to translate that into revenue. So um, you, most of the board were there a couple years ago when we came before you asking for permission to be able to enter into sales agreements. We were anticipating that we had a product that these other apple growing regions around the world would be interested in, and that is indeed the case. So this year we have, um, uh, we are very close to meeting our sales target of $650,000 in sales from products, either egg sheets or um, sterile coddling moth. And the biggest market for adult moths we found is right below us in Washington State, uh, where growers there are paying, if you can believe, over $500 US an acre for the delivery of our sterile moths to their farms. 
So that just gives you an indication of how tough times are for coddling moth management for growers and how desired our program is. And we plan to keep increasing those revenues. We're projected to um, increase somewhere in the 800,000 next year as we sort of cautiously um, ramp up sales. Um, go ahead there. I also come before you uh, on a decade of zero increases. So all this that we've been doing, becoming the envy of the apple growing regions of the world, uh, we've done without increasing taxes a single time, either to the growers or to the regional districts for 10 years now. And what that's meant for the program is truly doing more with less, because as Alan will walk us through, part of our revenues come from the growers, which means that as acreage has shrunk, gone to sweet cherries, gone to grapes, we've had less revenue coming in, but we've just found ways to be more energy efficient at the facility and to streamline staff and procedures. So, you know, we are here to talk about money, but we also come after a decade of not asking for more money at all. And then finally, uh, we're also here because we're still burdened with this 30-year-old piece of legislation that was the guiding, um, uh, guiding piece for the program 30 years ago, and it just no longer fits. So we see that in my coming to you to ask permission to make money off sales of product because that's not um, explicitly allowed in our legislation. It's not a permissive legislation. It's, it predates the Local Government Act. Um, we see that with taxes, so this question from the North Okanagan was really framed as what you're doing isn't in step with your legislation. And we knew that, but it is in step with what the four regional districts agreed upon uh, in 2007. And so that wasn't, you know, that's not necessarily solidified because we still go back to this old legislation. And then the question that we get asked frequently, both at the regional district tables and from other growers, is can't you do anything for cherries or for other producers? And at this time, we can't even contemplate that. Even if all the regional district boards were behind that, it's not something we can contemplate because we have this 30-year-old piece of legislation. So that's kind of the framework. Um, again, I'll, I'm going to turn it over to Alan to walk you through the whole governance process that it's taken to get here because we didn't, we didn't enter into this lightly. Um, and, uh, but if at any time you need the rah-rah SIR, I will be prepared to stand up and tell you why we are such a good program. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Melissa. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board for having us here today. Melissa mentioned that um, I have been involved with SIR as a consultant since 2003, so that's some time ago. And one of the reasons I think that, that I've been involved for that long, and it's kind of a kind of consultant's dream, you know, the project that never ends. And that's in part because the legislation Melissa referred to being very prescriptive, being very um, archaic in some ways. Um, it is, it is uh, the legislation that is set up under what's called the MIVAR, Municipal Enabling and Validation uh, Act. And so that, in, in essence, is kind of this, this odd kind of miscellaneous act that kind of comes up every year in the legislature and kind of captures a bunch of different things. It corrects mistakes that have been made by local governments. It enables local governments to do certain things. Um, but they're typically kind of one-off little things. So way back in 1989, the provincial government created the MIVA for that particular year and created this program under the MIVA called the SIR, the, as Bill mentioned, the Okanagan Kootenai Sterile Insect Release Program, because in those days it involved the Kootenai areas as well. A very prescriptive piece of legislation and has and given the board and the regional district boards problems ever since because the legislation was never intended to last very long because the program was never intended to last very long. When the, SI pro when the SIR program came in, the goal of the program was to eradicate codling moths. As the program got going, the scientists and all the other people who had kind of put their heads together to conceive the program realized, oh, okay, that goal doesn't actually work. Our goal now is going to be to manage codling moth infestation. So that turned the program from something that was envisioned to be time limited to something that became more permanent in nature. Unfortunately, at the time that that realization was made, the legislation wasn't modernized to allow a program to evolve and to respond to different challenges that Melissa talked about earlier. So we continue to have then these impediments 
in running this program, this, this really incredible program of four different regional districts throughout this entire area, uh, from the border all the way up to the shoe swap and into the Similkameen. So very unique program. The government in Victoria has had, has always struggled with, with how to introduce some kind of change to the legislation um, that will help to modernize it. And one of the reasons that there's been a struggle is because the four regional districts haven't always been on the same page. And at times, however, they do get on the same page. And this seems to be hopefully one of those times. So we'll get into what it is that, that we're proposing, that the SIR board's proposing, and, uh, and, and present it to you. And then as Melissa said, we're more than happy to answer any questions. Let me just explain um, kind of what it is we're going to, that I'm going to present to you just uh, this afternoon. First of all, just a little bit about the SIR governance review that Melissa referred to, where it started, kind of what process we're on, and where, we're, where we are at this particular juncture and what we're bringing to you out of that review. Um, then look at the working group on apportionment. That's kind of the focus of today, that whole apportionment issue. That is kind of the cost sharing issue that Bill talked about earlier. Uh, we get right into the cost sharing options then the working group talked about and, and, the, and explored and, and ultimately then we get to the recommended approach which has been put before you in the form of a, of a paper but we're also gonna lay it out in some of our slides today. The phase in provision is a key part of the recommended approach and it's particularly important for RDOS. So we're gonna go through that and just make sure that's, that's clear to, to, uh, to all the directors as well uh, as we work through that. And then finally, we'll just outline the request for the resolutions that as Bill mentioned, we'll be coming back to the board, I guess on November 19th. So governance review. Um, all stemming again from this legislation under which the SIR board works and, <clears throat> and the program is, is managed. So in, uh, in early, 19, early 2019, the CAO's committee, that is a committee, as the name suggests, of the four regional district CAOs, so RDOS, RDCO, RDNO, and uh, Columbia Schuswab, the four CAOs from the regional districts who participate in the program came together as a committee, and it's a kind of a standing committee, uh, and thought, oh, and said, okay, we're going to the time seems good. We're going to uh, we're going to in, initiate or, or recommend that we initiate a review of our governance for this particular program because we're running into too many issues, issues that have persisted for some time in most cases, but it's kind of the time is is was was believed to be right to start to explore some of these. So uh, as Melissa as oh, excuse me. as Melissa mentioned, um, it was and Bill, I think you mentioned it as well in your opening comments, the impetus for the governance review really was a, uh, a concern put forward by one of the members, by Regional District North Okanagan. And the concern was about the way in which the partners share the value tax burden, that is the property tax burden for the service. The legislation is very prescriptive on how that is to be shared. As Melissa noted, in 2007, the parties got together and said, look, this prescriptive piece here, this, this prescription with respect to cost sharing that was um, developed back in 1989 doesn't really work for the broader program in 2007. So much has changed in the assessment base and who's in and who's out of the program that collectively we want to come up with a new approach. Collectively then the group had done that and a new approach was implemented, but it wasn't in sync with the actual legislation because the legislation never changed in Victoria to keep, to keep pace with it. So there was a concern raised by RDNO to kind of go back and look at that value uh, tax apportionment. And that was a legitimate concern because just as in 2007, a lot had changed since 1989, in 2019, a lot had changed since 2007. So in the same way then that every regional district will from time to time review the services and how decisions are shared or decision-making power shared and how costs are shared, the SIR as a service of four regional districts thought it would be a good time to review then how those costs are shared among those four regional districts. There were a bunch of other issues to explore we won't get into at this point. Um, hopefully in the future we'll come back to you and, and, and look at some of those other issues, but there were some other issues that were also explored as part of that governance review. The board 
of the SIR considered that recommendation then in early, 20, in early 2019 and came up with this, with this resolution that the board lead a formal collaborative and focused governance review process to address tax apportionment and other concerns with the intent to submit the results to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs with a request for legislative change. So bringing it right back to Victoria to say, let's put in place now that legislative change that we've needed for some time. This is the time to do that. So the process then for the governance review and how it kind of um, provides a nice platform for what we've got to talk to you about today. So the first thing, uh, the groups came together with representatives from each of the regional districts, uh, both at the elected level, so Director Bush from RDOS, and at the staff level, so Bill from, from RDOS as well came together in, a, in an initial workshop in the spring of 2019 to say, what are the issues that we want to address? We know that tax apportionment is one of them. We know that there's some other issues. Let's get them all out on the table and make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to what it is we're going to be looking at. Looked for common ground and then kind of set out some potential ways forward. Over the uh, summer of that year then, last year, <coughs> excuse me, um, Staff and, and consultants uh, worked to kind of develop some of the structural changes to deal with the apportionment issue, kind of looked at fleshing out some of those options, and also then started to look at uh, legislative reform. And so, and there's a paper attached to some of the documents that you got, uh, which gets into some of those legislative reform issues. The group, the larger group, came back together then in the fall of 2019, looked at those options, those proposals, those proposals for change, um, and then decided, you know what, the tax apportionment issue, how we share this tax burden is complicated. We think we need to have a smaller subgroup of folks uh, from this group, from the broader group, the smaller subgroup, come together in a separate venue and give us some, some uh, focus study and some recommendations then on the preferred tax apportionment option. So that working group then was formed. I'll come to that in a moment. The working group on apportionment, um, there were some interviews in this, this most recent summer then to, uh, and, and we did the interviews of course because COVID had hit and so we needed to work remotely. So we reached out and, and dealt with and, and, and talked to each of the different regional districts. So we had representatives again from each of the regional districts and, um, and identified recommendations to go to the board. And then uh, we're here today with briefings to the regional districts. This is the first regional district we've come to. We're going to the others after this and we are um, putting forward some requests for resolutions. When we look at the, the working group, oh, I beg your pardon, this is very sensitive. There we go, let's go there. <laughs> First of all, maybe let me just pause for a moment and just kind of take us half a step back to look at how the SIR program is funded in its entirety. When we look at the SIR, we've got essentially three different sources of revenue. We've got the value added tax, that is what we typically think of as the property tax. All taxpayers pay that, so whether you, if you own land in the, uh, in the broader service area, you are paying towards that value tax. And that has been fixed at $1.7 million for the last 10 years. Melissa talked about that. The second area that we have at the bottom in the purple is the parcel tax. And the parcel tax is paid directly by the commercial growers. And they pay a certain tax per acre of, of, uh, of lands or of orchards. And so that is, is kind of a, a, almost a user fee in essence by those who kind of benefit most directly from the service. So we've got general taxpayers for the value tax and we've got, we've got commercial growers for the parcel tax. We've then got this third bit, which is growing all the time. Melissa talked about that, which is the sales of service. So in 2019, that was half a million dollars. That's gone up now to $650,000, and we understand that it is, continues to go up over the years. And that becomes important as we look moving forward in terms of how to, how to keep um, control over the ultimate tax requisition that would go to taxpayers. So the working group on apportionment was responsible solely for the value tax. So not looking at the parcel tax, not looking at the sales of service, solely at the, at the, at the value added tax, the property tax. 
And that chunk of money there, that $1.7 million that has remained fixed for some time, that's what we refer to as the value tax burden. And that's what we're looking to uh, figure out how to allocate or how to apportion among the regional districts. Okay, so the working group was established then to recommend a new method of apportioning that value tax portion. Um, we have in place a, a fixed proportion approach that was done in 2007, and that was called into question. We're gonna look at that a little more in a moment. Uh, we, the, the working group was formed, one SIR director or alternate from each of the regional districts, and one CAO or a CAO designate from each of the regional districts. So again, from RDOS, we had Director Bush and we had Bill. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. I talked about having the, uh, we had our, our kind of mid-lockdown interviews with each delegation to kind of identify what some of the concerns were and some of the, the desires were from each of the regions with respect to cost sharing, what everybody thought was fair. Held a workshop in uh, this past summer and just a few highlights from both the kind of a few principles, if you will, or, or foundation points that were that came to us from the interviews and then also from the workshop the first is that is that everybody talked about how important the partnership is how the val the partnership is valued strongly this particular service is really one of a kind it is a one of a kind interregional service in which four regional districts have come together and said we are going to use the authority given to us back in 1989 to create this service and to continue in this service and um we're gonna do that on a voluntary basis, coming together and staying in this program to do this because we think it's important. And we share then the decision-making power and we share the cost. So that's important. Uh, another key finding to highlight, the benefit is, is targeted but also broad. What do we mean by that? So everybody had kind of understood, everybody we talked to from the regional districts understands this point. And that is the idea that when we think of the purpose of SIR and when we think of the benefit, it benefits not only a in a targeted sense, that is the growers who use the sterile calding moths to protect their orchards, that's the targeted benefit, but it also protects, it also benefits in a very broad way the broader public. So right up and down the valleys, again from the border up to the shoe swap and into the similcamine. So the benefit to that broader group is, is really found in, in environmental benefits, uh, protection of ecosystems and lakes and, and communities from, from, um, uh, from toxic uh, uh, pesticides that don't have to be released into the orchards because, or don't have to be released to the same degree because we've got caldy moth. Benefits to the communities, the urban communities that don't have to worry as much about spraying because we have this caldy moth uh, control in place. So all these different benefits, the, these broad benefits to the broader communities, those were recognized. The groups also had, talk, had recognized that the fairest approach going forward in terms of sharing the cost, sharing that value tax burden, reflects in part each region's relative benefit. So when we look at the regions, you may know that we've got different zones in the SIR and each zone kind of benefits a little bit differently. So RDOS is in the first zone, and that is, and it is called zone one because it was the one that, the, that, that where, where the program really started. It, it was kind of rolled out starting with RDOS back in the 19, early 1990s. <clears throat> so um, RDOS, because it has the highest number of commercial acres, of palm fruit acres, the, 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 the highest number of orchards, if you will, uh, it, receives most of the service from the program. So it has that kind of direct relative benefit and it's relative benefit, or it has that benefit that relative to others is greater. So the view then was that the fairest approach reflects in part each region's relative benefit. The idea too was that if we look, whenever you look at a new way of sharing the tax burden, Inevitably, there's going to be some who take on more, a larger share and some who take on a, a smaller share. And for those who take on a larger share, it's important to kind of understand or to kind of recognize what we termed as principle-based pragmatism. That is, we want to divide or allocate the burden based on strong principles 
But then the number that comes out the other end, we have to be pragmatic. We have to kind of say that, look, we got to this number based on principles, but is that number, notwithstanding the principles, is that realistic? Is that saleable? Is that acceptable as a number? Is it too high? Is it too low? So we wanted to kind of recognize that as well. Um, another key finding to highlight then is that uh, the group determined that some kind of hybrid approach, that is an approach that kind of looks at more than one base of cost sharing, some kind of hybrid approach to reflect both the broad benefit to the broader community and the environment and the, and, and the urban areas, and the differences in the amount of service provided was the way to go forward. So right now we have in place a single base uh, in, in, in approaching our cost sharing, we wanted to go to something that looked at two, brought together two different metrics or two different factors to determine cost sharing. Just very briefly then, um, the group noted that the new revenues are going to help going forward to keep the lid on tax increases. It may not offset them entirely, but at least kind of keep them in check a little bit. So that had to be recognized. Wanted to recognize as well that service area is an issue. Service area, I'll just mention very briefly, when we look at the four different regional districts that participate in the, RDO, in the SIR program, each, uh, each uh, regional district has in a different amount of its land base in the service. RDCO is the only one of the four regional districts that has the entire regional district in the SIR program and therefore paying towards the SIR program. Every other regional district, including RDOS, has carved out areas where there's commercial orchards and have said those areas are going to be in the program and those areas plus all the urban areas around those areas will pay towards the program, but all the other areas we're gonna keep out of the program. RDOS, RDNO, CSRD has, have all taken that approach. So RDCO kind of raised service areas and issues and said how do we kind of over time get some parity one way or another there. And then finally, um, the growers parcel tax. We wanted to emphasize again that we're not looking at change. We don't have the mandate as the working group to change the growers tax, and that any tampering with that growers tax, any change with that parcel tax is going to be a conversation with the growers as well. And now the consensus seemed to be is not the greatest time to start that conversation, even if it's warranted because of some of the financial difficulties in the industry. Okay, let me move on and look at the cost sharing options and just walk you through those very briefly. Again, we'll just remember that the current arrangement we have in place is we're focusing on that $1.7 million value tax. That's what we're focusing on. That chunk of money is what we're looking at allocating. Um, currently, what we have in place is a fixed percentage for each regional district. So since 2007, we've had this in place here where every year, RDOS pays 20.8% of that value tax burden, um, which works out to $356,000. And that has been every year for the last 10 years because that 1.7 million total hasn't changed in that time. RDCO every year pays 58.6, RDNO every year 17.2, and CSRD 3.4. Why is CSRD so small? Because we've only got portions of two jurisdictions in the area. The rest are too far north at this time to have uh, palm fruits uh, uh, on a commercial basis. Um, <clears throat> what's important to recognize with the current approach, not only does it kind of not sync with the legislation, with that prescriptive 1989 legislation, but it also is set at each region's 2006 converted land base. So, what, we, what the group decided in 2007 is said, based on the 2006 uh, conditions that are in place, we are going to fix the cost of apportionment based on those conditions. So they started off in 2007 saying, it's going to be based on land, uh, or the, the, the assessed value of our, our or the assessment uh, values there as they relate to land. But then once that was put in place, it became fixed. And it's been remained that case ever since. So those percentages haven't changed since. And I mentioned then it has been fixed for that period of time, hasn't been impacted by any change in the assessment basis throughout the region. So even though we've seen an increase in one region relative to the increase relative to the value in another region, we haven't seen any reallocation of those cost formulas. 
So the group looked at three different options. The first option, and remember we, one of the foundation points was that it was going to be a hybrid approach, one that looked at the benefit not only to the broad area, but also to the individual areas. So, uh, and that would mean having two different factors to, in, in the cost sharing uh, basis. The first then is uh, a 50-50 split between converted assessment, land and improvements, and taxable acreage. So what that says in, in, in essence is, is that we use the full converted assessment base. Right now it's just based on land, so this would be land and improvements. So we use the full converted assessment base. We uh, have in this a significant weight on acreage, it's a 50-50. So right now it's just based on assessment. We would, in, in, we would bring in also the number of acres in each place. And that would put, and by having it 50-50, it would put quite a bit of weight on that. And under this option, then the amount allocated would change every year in response to changes in the land base and also changes in the assessment base, the converted assessment base. So as regions um, either gained or lost taxable acres of, of, uh, of apples and pears, they would, uh, their, their rates would change. As regions lost or gained in converted assessment, their rates would change. The amount that they owed, that they contributed towards the, broad, the, the entire value tax burden would change. What option one did was to cause quite a shift in the amount owing in the requisition for RDOS. And the reason it caused quite a shift is because, as I mentioned earlier, RDOS has um, the largest number and therefore the greatest proportion of taxable acres of palm fruit uh, orchards. So if we look at the current, again, fixed here, the option one would see this shift. So we see there the red, RDOS would go from 20.8 to 32.3, which would be quite a shift in the amount that RDOS would pay of the value tax burden every year. That was one of the options the group looked at. The second option was to say, okay, let's look again at converted assessment, both for land and improvements, and let's also take into account each region's share of taxable acres but let's weigh them a little bit differently. Let's put 75% of the weight on converted assessment and 25% of the weight on the taxable acres. So what does that do? Well, first of all, we use again the full converted assessment base. We have a greater weight on the broad benefit, but we also recognize the level of service provided. What do we mean by that? So the greater weight on the broad benefit, converted assessment is typically used as a way to say that everybody benefits from this service, therefore we're going to include everybody on the basis of taxation or assessment. So we tend to use converted assessment as a base for sharing costs when it's a very uh, broad benefit service, a true public good service as it were. And there's certainly an element of that with SIR, a big element. So the group said, let's weigh 75% to that. We use other measures when we want to kind of look at the differences in the level of service provided. We can use population. We can use uh, a, a more a kind of precise figure of the actual number of moths released, for example. Um, what the group said was, let's take a, a simple approach and say, base it on taxable acres. And that will then kind of give a sense of the different amount of service provided to each regional district. We want to recognize that, but we don't want to give it the same weight as that broad benefit. So 75-25. And again, the amounts every year would change in response to changes in the underlying assessment base in response to the changes in the underlying proportion of taxable acres. Under this option then, we still see a shift to RDOS, but it would be more modest because we've lowered the emphasis or the weighting on the taxable acres. And so that ben would benefit our DOS in that sense. So when we look at the current again is fixed, option one would see quite a shift to our DOS. Option two would still see a shift, but a much lower shift. And both of these options, oh, beg your pardon. Both of these options, again, those percentages would change over time. And that was one of the principles the group really wanted to see reflected in there. The last option the group looked at was to say, let's look again at that 75-25 so that we, take a, we don't put too much weight on the number of taxable acres, the proportion of taxable acres. But instead of having converted assessment land and improvements, the full converted assessment base, let's focus only on the land base, which is what we use right now in the system. 
So we've got a greater weight on land assessment further moderates the impact. So in other words, there would be less of an impact on RDOS if we just focus on the land, because once we throw in to the assessment base, once we throw in the, the value of improvements as well, then um, we, we have more of a, of, a, of a equality across the areas and therefore more of a shift to RDOS. Um, again, the amounts allocated would change in response to those underlying factors every year, which is something that the group was wanted to focus on. So what is the, the outcome here? Less reflective of the benefit to communities and residents. Why do we say that? Well, when we focus just on the land portion of converted assessment, we take away some of the kind of the broad benefit that is that is that is given to or, or conferred to conferred on um, urban areas and residents. When typically when we're looking at funding public services, we and the reason we include improvements in that tax base is because improvements are, are seen to kind of be reflective of the urban areas, reflective of people and and communities urban communities so when we include that as a basis for allocating our costs we uh we reflect that benefit to not only to the land base and the ecosystem but also to the communities to the urban areas so this particular option then that would take away the improvement part of the assessment base would also then give less, be less reflective of that benefit to communities and residents and focus more on the broad benefit to the land and the ecosystems. Um, we did find there were equity concerns for RDCO under this option because RDCO has a disproportionately high land value compared to the other areas. And so when we throw in the improvements, that RDCO's total proportion kind of goes down a little bit. When we take out the improvements, because land is so expensive in RDCO, it starts to take on uh, more of the cost burden. And then finally, it was also thought that if we focus just on land, we may not fairly uh, tax properties within each regional district that have relatively low land values. So if you're living in a, in a strata, a condominium, for example, and you look at your tax your tax bill every year, your land value as a proportion of your total value will be lower than if you're if you're on a uh, an area you know a single family house for example or or some other type of development that has a greater land value. So we want it to be fair within each of the regions as well. So what did the group decide then? Well, modify a little bit the RDOS portion from option two, but not much. Okay, so the recommendation of the working group, and again, I want to emphasize this working group was made up of representatives from each of the four regional districts. So the recommendation from the working group was to go with option two. That is to have that 75-25 with converted assessment, land and improvements, weighted at 75%, and taxable acreage weighted at 25%. Recognize the broad benefit, um, to the, the community, both the lands and the ecosystem and the residents in the urban areas. It's also a familiar basis in the sense when we use converted assessment, land and improvement, all of the services that the regional districts um, provide and, and pay for are paid for on the basis of land and improvements. So the SIR program as it exists today is a bit of an anomaly in that sense. Uh, and the uh, option two also kind of um, put a bit of a check then on the, or, or compensated for, reflected the fact that RDCO has higher or disproportionately high land values. And so we were able to soften that a little bit. So that was the recommendation. Another part of the recommendation was to say, we, we want to have a phase in period. So, um, and when I say we, again, that's the working group. So the working group recommended a phase in period. And a phase in period is common whenever you come up with a new cost sharing formula that again will shift some of the cost onto more of the cost onto one party or two parties and less of the cost onto others. And we do the phase in period because it's not, it's not fair to kind of expect a party to respond in a quick, in a quick next fiscal year to a new, a new formula, but rather let's phase it in over, uh, and the, the working group's recommendation was four years. And the other recommendation then is to look uh, over time then at some kind of service area extension mechanism on how to bring in new lands. Let me talk a little bit of the phase and provision and then we're, we're pretty much at the end here. So <clears throat> for many years, as I mentioned kind of earlier in the presentation, the allocation of 
the tax burden, it was relatively simple. And it was simple for a couple of reasons. The total amount, that is the total requisition for all four regional districts was fixed at $1.7 million. That didn't change for over a decade. And then the allocation of that total amount, so of that $1.7 million allocated across the four regional districts, that allocation was also fixed because we based it using that 2006 formula on the assessments in that year and then fixed it as a percentage. So all of those things were fixed. Under the phase in of a new method, it's a little more complicated. So how do we phase that in over four years? And it's more complicated because the total amount, that total requisition is expected to change. It might not change a lot. It may not change in the first year, but we know it's going to change. It won't be exactly $1.7 million again. And the allocation of that $1.7 million across the four participating regional districts is also going to change every year instead of staying, staying fixed as it has, it's gonna change every year in response to a couple of things. Changes in the underlying assessment base because it changes every year. And so your proportion as a regional district of the total assessment base for the whole service area will change just as the other regional districts proportions will. And also changes in the taxable acres. So what we're seeing uh, is a bit of a trend whereby um, in every area, well, I shouldn't say every area, in RDOS, we're seeing a, a constant decline in the number of taxable acres for palm fruit. So as, as Melissa mentioned, there's, there's, uh, there's acres being converted to, to vineyards. There's acres being converted to sweet cherries. So we're seeing a constant decline over the years. We're also then starting to see a bit of an increase uh, in taxable acres for palm fruits as we go further north, particularly in RDNO and, and even a little bit in CSRD. And that's, that's one of the implications perhaps of a changing climate because we've got changing growing seasons where um, earlier, uh, some years ago in, in those climes, it was not as, as easy to have palm fruit orchards and now we're finding it's become easier. So we're seeing acres being added in the north and acres being lost in the south. So those acres change over the years and that factor changes. So when we take into account the changes in the overall uh, tax burden from the 1.7 to something else, and when we take into account the changes in the underlying assessment and proportion of taxable acres, we can, we can, we're going to have changes every year in what's paid. And so it becomes tricky to kind of phase in that amount over four years. But we were able to do that. We had a technical paper that we put together and reviewed with, with the staffs. And so with Bill and with Jim Safino, we've reviewed that paper. And what we see then is over a four-year period under this new approach that recognizes both converted assessment, that broad benefit, and the number of taxable acres, um, that we see RDOS share of the total would increase over that period of time. <clears throat> this model here, this graph, indicates kind of uh, shows an example of this increase. And I say an example because we've made some assumptions in doing this graph. I mentioned that the trend we're seeing with respect to taxable acres is a decrease in RDOS and an increase in some other places. So what we've as assumed over a four year period here is a, is a continuation of that trend. We also see <clears throat> some changes then in each regional district proportion of, of converted assessment base. And we see that RDOS's proportion of converted assessment base has gone down. That's the trend relative to the other regional districts. So we've taken that into account in making this graph. So if we hadn't taken it, made those assumptions, the 422,500 would actually be higher. But we know that we're seeing these changes. And because we've got a formula that changes over time with respect, in response to changes to assessment base and taxable acres, we can, with confidence, kind of moderate the increase a little bit. So we see over a four-year period, RDOS going up a total of $66,000 from the current, which has been in place for 10 years, up into the new one of 422 under this model. RDCO uh, comes down from a little over a million to about to a little over 950,000 and the others really don't change too much. Even RDNO that had prompted the review in the first place because it thought that it was not being fairly treated comes down only a little bit over those four year period. I had mentioned that uh, 
we were did want to present requests for resolutions and that's in the package and I know it'll be coming back to the board on, on November 17th or 19th I beg your pardon but I'll just mention here we've got uh, we've got those those in there so the first is that the regional district board supports apportioning the annual value tax burden of the SIR program among re participating regional districts using a hybrid formula that determines each regional district's annual value tax requisition on the regional district proportion of the previous year's converted assessment base, land and improvements, for the program service area as a whole, weighted 75%, and the regional district proportion of the previous year's total taxable acreage for the program service area as a whole, weighted at 25%. So that hybrid approach we talked about, that being option number two. The other uh, resolution that the regional district board supports phasing in the new apportionment approach over a four year period. And then finally, an in, in, uh, important one here, that the regional district board supports a request from the four participating regional districts to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for an order in council to implement the new apportionment approach and phase in provision. Why are we asking for an order in council? We've obviously been dealing, or, or as you can imagine, we've been keeping the ministry staff apprised of all the workings of the working group and the governance review, and their advice is come to us with a request for an order in council supported by the four regional districts, and we can make the change. So these resolutions are going to all four regional districts. This presentation is going to all four regional districts. All four regional districts were, presented, were represented on the working group that came forward with the recommendation. So that is what we've presented to you today. And uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Newell, we're more than happy to take questions. Thank you for your patience going, in going walking through that. Let me just add a few things. Um, Participant-wise, out of our 15 jurisdictions, so only Area H and Princeton do not participate. Okay, So the other 13 jurisdictions do. The, I mean, nobody likes paying more taxes, uh, especially Director Bush. <laughs> so uh, these were tough discussions for us uh, at the table. But when you look at it and you see that our portion is going up about 5% uh, of the total amount. And let's face it, Columbia Shoeswap is a very small player in this. They're like 3% uh, of the total. So it's mostly the three uh, Okanagan uh, regional districts that participate. So with us at about 25% so or 20%, so we go up about five on this and the other two participants come down a couple each. We have 45% of the uh, taxable acreage and about 45% of the MOST. Uh, so counting the MOST. So when we look at that, we like the program. We, we like apples and we like pears and we want to see uh, our orchardists who also pay uh, through parcel tax uh, be successful. So uh, is, it, uh, is it fair? Probably. It's probably fair for us to pay about 25% uh, of the total cost of the program, which is that 1.7 million uh, that was presented. For us, uh, that means about a dollar sixty that we would go up. That's what that five percent uh, would evidence itself as. So over the four-year period, which is the phase in, uh, uh, we'll be going up about forty cents uh, per property in the participating areas. Okay. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, then we should take questions. Okay, great, thank you very much. I'm just wondering, Danny, if we might be able to remove the presentation from the screen so we could see Director Canodal and Director Robinson in case they have any questions. I'm gonna go now to Director Gettins. Thank you to the chair. Thank you for the presentation. I think the working group put a lot of thought into this and um, I know it would have been an interesting conversation. My question is around the pie chart that we're seeing here. The pie chart is how we currently, or the different options are representing that $1.7 million split. But what would this have looked like based on our taxes last year? So your option two in the RDOS takes on the 25.6%, and I think you said that's about 425,000. If we had this formula in place last year, what would our total contribution be of the RDOS based on the assessments that you've got laid out, please? 
Th thank you very much. If we had that, uh, if through the chair, if I may, if we had uh, that this formula in place now, we would be looking at 420. We would look at that 422 thousand dollars. If the formula were in place based on last year's uh, uh, taxation, or sorry, based on last year's converted assessment and last year's taxable acres, so. What we've said here is that this formula would take the amount owing for our DOS from the 356 to the 422, but rather than do it in one year, which would be kind of the answer to the, the question you posed, we're, we're going to phase it in over four years. So, sorry, if I can ask a follow up. So, because the idea is that you need more support, like you need more funding to do what you want to set out. So, this will give you more funding, right, if you're doing it on taxes? Or is it still just how you're splitting up? You're not looking to increase the cap of the 1.7. Got you. That's right. Unfortunately, through the chair, this all this headache is a zero sum game for us. This is just about that okay. 1.7 million and how we split that between the regional districts. So it hasn't okay. actually contemplated an increase, which as I said, you know, we've fended off for a decade, but the by far the biggest line item in our budget every year is seasonal labor and you know minimum wage has gone up by almost four dollars and a two percent sure. employer's health tax. So we're that's why we're pumping up those sales to try and offset that further. But right now, this is just a zero sum. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question, um, probably for CAO Newell. If we uh, approve this and we're looking at the start uh, phase in of year one, do we intend that to hit the 2021 budget or is the uh, acquiring an order in council going to delay it to 2022? I'm not sure, sorry, uh, I'm not sure on the schedule on this, but I think we need that legislative change before we introduce the new formula, would we not? Um, no, so <clears throat> ideally we would have legislative change, but we would go on the precedent that was set in 2006, which is that the province has um, you know, tacitly accepted uh, four regional districts all agreeing together and then implementing that without the order in council. So if all four regional districts agree, as we've discussed with regional or with the uh, provincial staff, we would go ahead and implement for this year and follow up with that order in council in recognition that that's quite a long process. Okay. So uh, some of our members will like this, some will not. So this is SIR ignoring the legislation and because the four partners agree on an approach, uh, we're going to implement in 2021. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Holmes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to say that this uh, program is extremely popular in my community, and, and I don't think uh, too many people will have a problem paying an extra 40 cents. Um, <clears throat> though I wanted to just ask a question um, maybe I missed it. Uh, going right back to the beginning, though, um, just the very principle of including a taxable acreage in the value tax. And I mean, if 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 you have a house in 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 the uh, suburbs in Penticton, and you have a house in the suburbs of Kelowna, you're both receiving the exact same public benefit. Uh, you know, the environment the environmental environmental impacts don't really stop at a regional district uh, border, right? Um, so uh, I'm just trying to figure out what the, the whole fairness principle behind that. And, uh, you know, does it really matter where the apples are grown? Everybody in the whole valley benefits from that. So, uh, you know, am I missing something? Or, you know, why, why is it included? Thank you very much for the question. It gets to the nub of the issue. Um, you're quite right that, that the same property in RDOS or RDCO or any of the other regional districts is going to benefit in the same way in that broad benefit. And so we use converted assessment to reflect that broad benefit that is equal, we assume, throughout the entire service area. The taxable acreage, which would make up, which would be the basis for 25% of the cost, that's not equal, in the, or that reflects kind of the relative benefit to each um, individual region, and that's and that's a little bit different because if you have uh, if you if, if that same house you refer to is in RDOS as opposed to RDCO, you in RDOS as by virtue of the fact that you are part of this regional district are actually getting uh, a far higher amount of the service from the program than is going to RDCO. 
So everybody benefits in terms of environment and all that good stuff, but the actual cost to the program to provide the program is much higher in RDOS than it is in RDCO because so much more of the resources for the program go to RDOS than RDCO or RDNO. So what the working group tried to do is to say that let's choose a formula that puts most weight on that broad benefit, that really reflects that broad benefit that we all share in equally. But let's also recognize at a lower weighting the fact that each regional district receives a different level of service in the sense of the different amount of the services resources. And let's try to reflect that as well. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Canodal. I've got a number of, of concerns here or issues. Uh, first off, we'll oh, he indicated at the start. <laughs> uh, you indicated at the start that the part of the problem is here he is. Still there? Oh, there he is. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, Director Canodal. Uh, at the start of this discussion, the part of the problem was the uh, the MEV. Uh, will this in any way help uh, change the MEV so that you can move on to a, a, a more profitable system? Uh, that's that's one of the concerns that I have, and I'm just wondering whether I should lay everything out and then let you answer. Um, uh, the other one is uh, the the benefit. Uh, in an environmental sense, do you have numbers as to the tonnage of sprays that are uh, uh, removed from the system by this program? And I, I believe it's in time, if I, by my memory of growing up on the farm and the amount of pesticides that we had to spray for uh, coddling moth, it seemed like we were doing it an awful lot. Uh, there, also, the other thing is the value to your intellectual material you're uh, gaining an enormous amount of uh, uh, experience and knowledge in how to use this uh, uh, system, how to how to make it work. I'm going to assume that there's a value in that beyond just selling the product. Uh, and I, I realize that other insects uh, like elm seed beetle and were at one time talked about. Uh, it would take a, a different. Uh, uh, establishment of, of a different uh, building to do that, uh, but that doesn't negate the uh, value to the uh, to the uh, property uh, in your knowledge, experience, in in uh, that you gained uh, creating this system. That's that's my list of questions. Uh, I'll follow up if I need to. Thank you. Okay, uh, so. Madam Chair, I'll go through them sort of one by one. Um, so the first question, Director uh, Knodal, and I would like to acknowledge, I think um, Alan missed it, the Director Knodal was also part of the governance workshop, so not on the working group, but was a part of the broader um, conversation. He came up to Kelowna. Uh, so the question was, if I got it correctly, was will it lead to a change in the MEVA? And I mean, the, the truest answer is, is no, because the MEVA will still exist. We'll have an order in council that sort of in a way adds on to that, but our governing piece of legislation is still 30 years old. So that was what the whole governance review proposal was about, is that if the four regional districts could agree, I would phrase it as, um, we, we're not asking for a longer leash at SIR, but we would very much like the regional district partners to hold that leash as opposed to the province who will deal with it when they have a little bit of time. Um, so it won't actually rid ourselves of the 30-year-old legislation, but it would make our tax apportionment implementation fully legal so that people couldn't say we're ignoring the legislation anymore. Um, so that, that was the answer to question one. Uh, the second question that I noted was, is there a number for tonnage of pesticides saved? Uh, I don't have a tonnage number um, with me, um, but we estimate it to be somewhere above 90%. So we actually estimated about 95%, but there's so much air built into that. Um, but if you look at 
why growers in Washington are willing to pay so much money for our moths, it's because they no longer have sprays left that they're allowed to put on. So um, growers in Washington are just on this pesticide treadmill. Now, for sure, the pesticides are nicer than they used to be when the program got started, right? We don't have the heavy organophosphates, um, but we are estimating that by having our program, the area saves, and this is corrected for declines in acreage, but about, you know, over 90% of the pesticides you'd have to use to, to um, protect against coddling moth. So that, that was the second, I think, uh, Director Knodel. And the third, I'm not sure that I quite got it, but I understood the question to be, is there sort of value in the sales beyond the product? And um, I would say yes. The, the program, in addition to selling these products, is, is helping um, organizations figure out how to set up their program. And the other piece that we get in return for that, uh, in particular with this Washington group, is uh, technological advances. So this will be the first year that we start our drone program, always looking at ways to um, reduce the cost. You can cover a lot more ground uh, releasing moths by drones. The moths like it a lot more than being shot off an ATV. They prefer to be in the sky. Um, and all of that technology has come to us through, through this partnership. So there is a lot more value being exchanged than just the $650,000 this year. Okay, thank you. thank you. Any other questions? I'm curious how you know the moths like it better from the drone. That is a really good question. Um, we measure it by how many we recapture. So we take how many we recapture on traps to be an indicator of how fit they are to fly around and sense females. And so we did some tests where we released them by ATV and you can powder them with a fluorescent powder. So we oh. shot some off the ATVs, they were powdered green, we dropped some from the air, they were powdered blue, and then we had some keen undergrad students look at those under UV light for weeks at a time and figure out where we recapture the most, and it's, it's more comfortable for moths to be dropped from the ground by recapture. Wonderful. I didn't expect that detailed answer. Thank you. Any other questions? No. I think everybody's good. Okay, so uh, my understanding is CAO that we're gonna see this come back on November 19th for further discussion and decision making on the requested resolutions. Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to thank Alan and uh, Melissa for your presentation today. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to discussing this in a couple weeks. So thank you for being here today. And I'll turn things over back to CAO Newell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you flip our PowerPoint back up, Danny? All right, I just wanna give you a brief introduction, um, a refresher for most uh, on who we are, and then I wanna get into some of our governance discussions. Thanks. And then, of course, uh, later on this afternoon, you have your inaugural meeting and the regional district, uh, or the, the regional hospital inaugural meeting. So uh, we'll definitely be uh, meeting those time requirements. So uh, this is who we are. We have 10,400 square kilometers in the regional district of Okanagan, Samilka. I mean, it's about 85,000 citizens over our 15 jurisdictions. Uh, we have nine rural areas and we have six urban areas so six of our uh, member municipalities ending up in our 19 uh, members uh, on the board of directors so this is our area oh sorry flip the screen doesn't do me much good to do it so, uh, and of course in uh, 2018, we welcomed our newest member, Electoral Area I, which was the split of Area D resulting from their governance review uh, just prior to that. So we have a broad geographic uh, area that we um, monitor. Of course, the large majority of it is empty. Uh, go ahead, Danny. So this is our voting structure. For those uh, just returning to the board or uh, that 
I may not remember uh, back to our 2018 orientation just after your election, uh, is that we have 19 jurisdictions, uh, which you can see on the second column uh, over there. We have uh, uh, representation on our board of directors based on uh, the number of citizens in the area. So for each 1,800 citizens, uh, that is either one vote or uh, one member. So uh, you can see with the city of Penticton, uh, because they have a larger population, uh, they have four members because one uh, member can only carry five votes. So as soon as you hit the five, you get a second member. Uh, and uh, because the city of Penticton has 19 votes based on that 1,800 citizens, they have four members. Okay? District of Summerland is the only other uh, recipient of that, uh, whereas they have seven votes, so they have two members. Okay? Everybody else uh, has the one member. Uh, and then based on the population of each of those 15 different jurisdictions, you can see how many votes on a weighted vote that they get at the table. So you can see, and I mean, frankly, uh, uh, the weighted votes mostly come with financial decisions. Uh, so on, on those very important financial decisions, uh, you can see that uh, A gets two votes, B gets one, uh, C gets three, et cetera. Uh, okay, Danny. So what are the difference, differences between uh, an incorporated community uh, and the regional district? You can see that we have a mixture of single tier, double tier government. Each of our nine electoral areas, the representatives are elected directly. For our six member municipalities, those representatives are elected to their member councils and then the council appoints a representative to the board of directors. So a uh, very odd system uh, in Canada, not, not too many other uh, provinces. In fact, I don't, I don't think there's any other provinces uh, that have this type of a system is that we have a, uh, th there are provinces that have uh, double tier governments uh, and there are uh, certainly provinces that have single tier, but very few uh, has that mix of single and double. The Local Government Act says that powers are vested in the board of directors, but in our, in our case, uh, not equally. And you saw how the votes go. So as you sit around the table and you make decisions, uh, some of our members uh, are more equal than others. It is a federation. We have those 15 different jurisdictions. So uh, our nine uh, ur uh, rural areas and our six urban areas, uh, they sit uh, together and they come up with decisions that are for the benefit of the whole. Okay? And that is the beauty of a regional district in the province of British Columbia is that we get this bigger picture uh, that protects a large geographic area. The other interesting distinction uh, for a regional district is even though you're elected for four years is that the regional districts elect their executive each year. So, uh, the chair and vice chair of a regional district and of a hospital district are elected annually. And you get to choose uh, from amongst yourselves who that will be. Okay. There are some required services uh, for a regional district, but not very many. So uh, in our legislation, um, uh, general government, electoral area administration, uh, regional planning, solid waste management, emergency preparedness, uh, and certainly the hospital district, they're required. Most of our services are discretionary. So the regional district of Okanagan Similkameen has 157 services. Only a very few of them are required. So in that case, you get to decide. And if you want to create a service, usually because it's a petition from a group of citizens or um, uh, from a larger population, is that we have to go out and ask for assent. So those citizens that we include in that service have to agree that they will pay for that service. 
uh, which is uh, different from an incorporated community. Okay. And then uh, the other difference is that uh, we do operate in this legislative framework. So the Local Government Act is our main piece of legislation. Community Charter is the main piece of legislation for incorporated communities. And uh, we're getting fortunate now where legislation is not quite so prescriptive or paternalistic. Uh, uh, most of them are enabling. So within the Local Government Act and the Community Charter, uh, most of it says, okay, uh, you have to do these certain things, but for the most part, uh, if a council or a board of directors wants to do something, then sure, follow the rules, but you get to choose, okay. which is much different than uh, a local government was uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Okay. Uh, they bestowed um, uh, uh, powers on uh, elected officials at a local level that they never used to have uh, as they started out. Okay, Danny. All right, so what we want to discuss is I wanted to take you through your legislative structure, so that's your committee uh, uh, board system, and then how we make decisions. So how we get an issue from port of entry to port of, uh, uh, sort of, uh, to decision. And uh, uh, we do this uh, on basically an annual uh, uh, calendar so that uh, uh, you have the opportunity to not only reflect on them, but to change them if you want to change them. And then the other thing we want to talk about in this context is really the purpose of a regional district is that bigger picture regional type of thinking and uh, how we want to uh, come together on that. So Danny, if you could put up that legislative structure uh, report. So each of you should have got this in your package um, that came out uh, with the agenda. Um, but Generally, uh, we have followed the same legislative structure since about 2009. Uh, that's when uh, that 2008 to 2011 board uh, had a complete governance review and decided uh, that this is how we were going to operate during that term. And then we reviewed it again uh, after the 2011 election and we uh, have been doing that ever since. And then occasionally, in the meantime, if we think that there's an interest in the board of changing the system, uh, it's uh, easily brought back. So uh, we, we did review this uh, on July 4th with this board of directors uh, at the time, and we were interested in testing uh, whether we wanted to create a uh, rural uh, area committee and whether we wanted to hire a specific rural area administrator. Uh, and we had a good discussion on it at the time and uh, determined that we'd proceed uh, based on our current system. And we have uh, really five pillars that we rely on for our structure. Okay, so this is not talking about our decision-making process at this point. This is the structure where we set up our five uh, select committees, uh, select committee being that one uh, uh, appointed by the board, standing committees are, uh, can be appointed by the chair. So our board of directors has decided that we will use a select committee system. And we uh, then developed a terms of reference uh, for each of those five select committees and uh, 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 which we can run through quickly if you want. Um, but generally we had, uh, looking at where we came from back in 2009, uh, right after that 2008 election, uh, the board at that time said, uh, we want everybody to have the same information. So we want to be a better informed board so that when we, we get into a decision-making uh, forum that we all have the same information, we can discuss issues uh, knowledgeably and logically, and uh, that uh, no one member would have uh, more information than another. So uh, we did that um, uh, in the context of establishing those five uh, select committees at that time. So even though all of the power is vested in the board, the board wanted the opportunity to discuss issues uh, that were more complex or significant in nature in a more informal setting, uh, which is what our committee system is intended to be. So uh, uh, we identified at that point 
uh, the five committees and what would uh, come into each of them. We thought uh, also, because we have such a large geographic area that if we had committees, we should have them all in one day. So we, at that point, uh, uh, determined on a schedule basis that uh, we'd have committees in the morning and then we would have a board of directors meeting in the afternoon, which is usually the way it works out. But uh, if we don't have much to discuss, we compress that. Um, uh, only having the committees on the agenda that have issues that require discussion that day. And then uh, the uh, recommendations from committee go from that meeting to the next. Uh, so that, uh, and there's a reason for that as well. Um, but it was at that point that we said, okay, we want everybody to be better informed. We want the opportunity uh, to get the administrative perspective through these administrative reports. We want to be able to add our political perspective at that point. And then that, that is also the time when uh, members of the public or delegations uh, that want to appear before all 19 members can come in in a more informal setting have more than 10 minutes, which is what we restrict uh, presenters to at our board meetings, to talk about these more complex uh, issues and to answer questions uh, that may come out of our uh, 19 members. The second pillar we talked about was that we wanted more uh, meaningful uh, input uh, at that time. So it was also um, the thought that Okay, let's get the preliminary information out at committee so that everybody has that same level of knowledge and uh, let's bring in those stakeholders that have the information that want to present to the board or ask permission uh, to do something from the board uh, and uh, get them at the table, get their unfiltered uh, information um, <laughs> rather than having it come through staff all the time and uh, that... Uh, um, not limit them to that 10 minutes. So uh, that was a, sec uh, a second one. The third one was uh, we know administratively that when a citizen has a request, they would rather talk to the elected officials. They don't want to talk to staff. So this committee system was the opportunity for citizens who had a specific ask to the board to come in and present that. And uh, we had always intended that uh, we open our committee meetings up more to the press and to the public because of that large geographic area. Obviously, uh, uh, those traveling from down in the South Okanagan or in the Similkameen, if they have an issue, uh, that, that's troublesome for them to have to come over. Uh, but we never ever got to the point where we were uh, streaming or televising our meetings. Uh, we had intended to, but there was the cost factor and other factors that just never enabled us to do that. So uh, with COVID uh, and the prompts that are required because of that, we're more quickly getting there now uh, than we have over those uh, last 10 years. And at the same time, uh, we wanted to uh, promote that uh, diversity of opinion where people could come in and talk uh, to the board about uh, and advocate for positions uh, that may not always come through administration. So uh, with now, uh, with our new um, uh, electronic access, members of the media and members of the public can much more easily come into our meetings and participate than they could in the past. So on this pillar, we're, we're actually making progress that we haven't had uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, we wanted wider public exposure. Uh, so uh, we wanted an entry point for a lot of the more significant decisions that the board has to make rather than bringing right into the board meeting and having you make that decision that day. Uh, even though uh, issues can be deferred, uh, at, uh, on most of the issues we'll bring in a report and uh, you'll consider them and uh, take the opportunity to vote at the same meeting. You, you would have that authority. By bringing them into a committee, there always is that interim two-week period uh, where you can either reconsider uh, your opinion on it or talk to people before a recommendation from committee comes into the board, uh, but it gives you more access or opportunity to more fully delve into issues than if you're dealing with them all at once uh, at a single uh, board meeting. And then the fifth one was uh, we just wanted to make it simpler and quicker. and. Uh, 
I can remember back in 2008, 2009, we had a lot of really big issues out there floating around, uh, either at uh, recreation commissions or APCs or in ad hoc bodies uh, that didn't really have a quick route to get in for informal discussion uh, from the elected officials. And then this system uh, was intended to provide that opportunity. So uh, that was the structure that, that uh, came up and um, uh, that we've reviewed from time to time and uh, is certainly available to the board uh, to raise at any point. And later on today, we're gonna do an assessment uh, of uh, a self-assessment where each of you get a chance to uh, discuss procedures and structures and you'll get a chance to uh, uh, comment on that as well. But I would say that if any time any member of the board has suggestions as to how we can make this better, uh, they're always uh, appropriate and it can simply come uh, by a request to put structure back onto a committee for discussion or to conduct a review uh, and uh, we can certainly do that. The five committees that were structured, uh, the board has adopted terms of reference on those. So we have corporate services, uh, planning and development, infrastructure, protective services, and community services. And it's pretty well self-explanatory as to what goes on there. Uh, all of our uh, support functions, those functions really uh, where, uh, that serve other uh, departments in the organization, those internally focused ones, all come through corporate services. Uh, the rest are uh, externally focused, um, planning development sort of being the more softer side and community services, uh, recreation uh, through there, and then protective services is police, fire, and ambulance. Uh, before I go on to decision making then, um, Madam Chair, are there any questions from the board? Anybody with questions? No, I think we're good, Bill. Okay, uh, let's talk about decision making then. So now that we've got this structure, how do we get an issue from port of entry to port of decision? So uh, we have in the past as a group um, adopted uh, what we call the informed decision making process. Uh, can you scroll down there, uh, Danny, just get right to the model? There should be a little chart. Um, it's probably on the policy, if you want to, yeah, if you go under there. All right. So. You can see on here, we've, we've tried to model this out. We, and we have some questions uh, that we have to resolve at some point. Um, not today necessarily, but just uh, uh, we think structural issues that at some point we need to have a chat about. Um, you can see that uh, there's various uh, points of entry uh, that an issue can come in at. Uh, either it can come in, uh, uh, and I mean, let's face it, usually they come in from administration, we'll, we'll get an issue, we'll do an administrative report, we'll bring it up to a committee and uh, enter it through the system there. They can come in at committee, uh, elected officials can bring an issue that they want us to investigate, come back with a report, they can come from a board meeting as well. So uh, those are the, sort of the three uh, points of entry. Uh, usually when we get an issue, uh, whether it's from any of those three, We'll do our administrative report. Uh, we'll take it up through our management team to make sure that our report is holistic. So usually uh, in a local government, there's all sorts of interdependencies. Uh, never does one issue really rely on one department. Anything that's gonna come in through uh, uh, our operations uh, department is gonna have a financial implication or a communications implication or a legislative implication. And the reason to take it through the management team is to make sure that those reports are holistic in nature, that all of those issues, uh, the board shouldn't have to worry about that. They should be uh, uh, confident that they're getting uh, that full uh, information when it comes to the table. We take it from the management team, get it on our agenda. Uh, that goes through committee. Uh, the committee makes a recommendation up to the board. And then uh, at the board table, you get your opportunity to debate that and then determine 
uh, if it's a resolution that's required and, and uh, it's approved, then we put it on the board action tracker and we'll bring that back to you from time to time uh, to give you an update. Actually, I think uh, you're gonna get a, a, a preview of your new board intranet, uh, which the board action tracker will be on. Uh, I think that's probably tomorrow. If you don't like it, uh, you always have the opportunity to refer it. You can either refer it back to a committee, you can refer it back to administration for additional information, uh, or you can send it out. Um, uh, many times on a planning issue, we'll, we'll send it out to our advisory planning commissions, or uh, we can send it out to recreation commissions, etc. cetera. So uh, lots of options uh, as far as how we get an issue uh, from uh, one point uh, in the board to the next. Um, can you go back to our <coughs> PowerPoint, Danny? Okay, so we, we've talked about our structure and I know, I know I'm going really fast. So if anybody wants to uh, uh, butt in, by all means, uh, just jump in. Um, We've talked about our structure and we've talked about our process now of how we get issues addressed. What's of always uh, interest to us when you, when you saw that model for decision making is uh, where do we bring in our uh, external committees? So not only does the board have five select committees, I believe we have about uh, I think it's 19 uh, ad hoc ones. So we've got all sorts of advisory planning commissions, we've got recreation commissions, uh, we've got water uh, commissions. And uh, typically what happens is, uh, what, uh, uh, let me go the other way. What would, <laughs> a, a normal procedure would be is that once a board creates a commission, is that, uh, and they're all advisory, is that it's that group's responsibility to advise the board. So typically what would happen is uh, administration would get an issue, they do their report, they take it out to the appropriate commission, and then the commission would make a recommendation back to the board because that's what you created them for. They're, they're advisory to the board. You're looking for that public input into those decisions. What we do, is that we'll do up our administrative report. Uh, in some cases, we'll go out to an advisory planning commission or we'll go out to a recreation commission. They'll discuss them, but then we send our administrative report to the board and we may have like a footnote or a one sentence saying really what this planning or, or recreation commission decided at their meeting, but the recommendation doesn't come from the commission, it comes from staff to the board. And we've talked about this in, uh, in the past and the board seems to like that. Uh, it confuses me a bit. Um, I mean, we're, uh, we're fine with it, uh, but it seems to defeat the purpose for creating those groups. One would think if you create an advisory group that you want the advice from that group. So uh, that's just uh, one of those things that makes you go, hmm, What's going on here uh, from an administrative point of view? So uh, I'm just gonna leave that with you for now, but at some point we should really figure out. And I think that's what uh, in, in some ways creates the confusion for your uh, commissions as well. Not so much for the advisory planning commissions. Uh, they're very regulatory. They have a section in the act that says what they're supposed to do. Recreation commissions are advisory, but uh, not all of them believe that, and, uh, and probably because we changed it on them uh, three or four years ago. Uh, but how do we get over that hurdle of uh, defining role, either for the commissions, those lay commissions, or for staff? Because the, the last thing that an elected group wants to do is get into a fight with one of their advisory commissions. You just uh, do not want that. And neither does administration, and I'm sure neither does the advisory group that you've appointed, but somehow we get into uh, this uh, competitive uh, uh, format where uh, nobody's happy. So uh, just something to think about. 
um, it keeps coming up. Every time we do our SWOT, uh, every year we do our strategic planning, we go through our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. This relationship that we have administratively with our lay groups is a problem for us and for them. So we need, we need somewhere along the line, um, you know, usually we do it through discussion, but uh, the advisory commissions are somewhat uh, arm's length, so we don't get into those, we don't get into these types of discussions with our advisory commissions. Um, you know, maybe we have to have some sort of a workshop with them, but at some point, I think the board um, needs to come to an agreement on just what the roles are on that uh, because it keeps coming up uh, administratively and it keeps coming up through commissions uh, and uh, it would be better if we could work it out. Now what I really want to talk about though is uh, this thing about uh, regional thinking. Can you uh, scroll down Danny? I'm not sure where this is in the thing. Okay well, yeah. So we have 15 different jurisdictions that sit around our board table, right? Nine rural, six urban. We all have a different perspective. Uh, we all uh, represent a certain constituency, and yet we're tasked with thinking regionally. So, uh, and we've had Elimina come in and, and talk about the which hat am I wearing uh, sort of discussion. And uh, he's always had some good points for us uh, on that. Uh, I mean, it's in the best interests of uh, everybody within the South Okanagan Similkameen uh, to be proactive and, and uh, to be working together. I think we all agree on that. But uh, where we get into uh, more discussion is when uh, something may seem to be in the best interests of um, one group over another, either uh, one electoral area over another, or one member of municipality over an un another, or more likely, uh, uh, either an urban municipality or an electoral area over another. And uh, we've always had this uh, trouble of coming up uh, with uh, uh, sort of a regional perspective. And that, I think, evidence itself uh, mostly uh, back when we were uh, uh, talking about regionally significant gas tax programs where the province challenged regional districts to come up with regional programs uh, that they could then submit for money. We couldn't come up with any regional programs because we were so focused on each of our 15 different jurisdictions that we weren't prepared to put forward anything uh, uh, that had a regional perspective. So. Uh, how do we get over it? And it's understandable, right? Uh, somebody that's elected on a municipal council is going to represent those municipal interests. Somebody that is directly elected to serve uh, an electoral area is going to, of course, uh, take uh, uh, into consideration what's best for their electoral area. So how do we get from one point um, to another? So uh, one, one more, Danny. So uh, here were some tips that Ellie Mina uh, came up with because uh, it was uh, his opinion that, um, let me make sure, I don't want to misquote Mr. Mina. He's a parliamentarian and he's uh, <laughs> an expert in his field. <coughs> so when he comes in and talks to us about his which hat am I wearing now, uh, type of discussion, uh, he would say, uh, there's always this conundrum. Do I represent my own local community or is my job on the Regional District Board of Directors to act in the interests of the entire district? There's a fundamental principle in shared decision making that collective interests <coughs> supersede personal interests or constituent constituency interests. So in his example, he says, okay, when you're elected to uh, a council uh, for an incorporated community, clearly your responsibility is to look at your municipality as a whole. It's not to represent certain special interest groups within the community that may have helped you get elected or uh, that may uh, have other uh, 
um, it's called this politics of intensity. Usually those, those groups uh, that uh, have a specific interest uh, can get very loud and uh, 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 sometimes intimidating. Um, but uh, courageous leadership would say one has to look not only at what's popular, but what's best for the community. And in this case, uh, uh, Mr. Mina was saying, uh, you have to look at what's best for your total community, not for special interest groups. And then he goes on to say, well, that is the same when you come on to the board of the regional district, is that you have to look at what's good uh, in the best interest of the complete uh, regional district. And, and that's where these tips come in. So he's saying where there's a conflict, uh, where uh, one um, might think that there are some negative uh, uh, points for your particular constituency, is that when you enter the discussion, try and educate the rest of the members as to what the impact on your constituency will be. Okay? So you have to educate. But at the same time, you've got to listen to what uh, your other members around the table are talking about uh, as to the impact of a decision on their constituency. So uh, through being better informed, is that you can make better decisions. So not only to come in and talk about the best interests of your community, but also to listen to others and then come up with a well-informed uh, position to make a, a decision from. He uses this phrase of construction, not combat. So he says, uh, build uh, strength from similarities and benefits, not just always looking at coming in with a mindset with a particular opinion, and then try, uh, entering into battle with your colleagues around the table based on what's best for your one constituency. Uh, so he's saying that um, that yes, you have to speak up, but also uh, you have to build this knowledge base and that uh, meetings should not become a combat zone where each community looks only after its own interests and treats other interests as a threat. He's saying that you have to bring your interests into the table, discuss it, and then uh, be prepared to listen to what other uh, members are talking about as, as well. And then you have to look at the global interest. Uh, so get your, get your points out on the table, uh, make sure that your colleagues around the table uh, are aware of them, listen to what everybody else is saying, try and convince your colleagues that your position or your point of view is correct. Um, but at the same time, uh, based on this better, this informed decision-making process uh, where you have uh, sort of dictatorship at one end and consensus at the other, and then as you come up that spectrum, uh, you have uh, sort of a majority decision where some organizations uh, don't have time for discussion. They'll put a motion on the table and you either vote for or against. And uh, in that case, where you don't have the opportunity for discussion, uh, the members that lose, uh, lose. And uh, don't often uh, understand why or don't take it uh, well because they don't understand the points of view as to what people were voting for when they voted positively. The informed decision-making model says that don't make a decision until all the points of view are out on the table. You've had an opportunity for discussion amongst yourselves, but then take the global position. Uh, once a vote is made on an informed decision-making process is that it is up to uh, the members um, to then uh, support that decision. You've had your chance to convince your colleagues on a certain methodology, didn't work, then uh, move on to the next. But uh, you can't at that point then go out and criticize the group for not uh, voting the way that you thought they should vote. You had your shot, you couldn't convince them. The greater good is that you take uh, this uh, comprehensive decision that comes out of the regional group. And then he goes on to say that uh, nobody said this would be easy. Uh, those are tough decisions when you get into those types of discussions uh, where you have certainly a point of view. Um, he, he also uh, always says, always go into a discussion with an open mind, right? And, and in fact, that's a legislative requirement. You are, uh, you are uh, required 
to be objective when you go into a discussion. You can't be taking positions and then coming into the board and trying to sell them. You have to be able to listen uh, either to a group that's coming before you asking for something or uh, your colleagues coming up with another point of view. Uh, you, you always have to be prepared to compromise and uh, uh, to uh, learn from the discussion that's going on. You, you can't come in with a position a closed mind and then not be prepared to change. Even in Karameas. <laughs> <laughs> we know what compromise is. <laughs> but you know, when you're talking about this, regional benefits, ask Princeton and uh, Tulumine why they're not paying into the sterile insect release program, hey? <laughs> <laughs> that was not the reason. <laughs> and then he says uh, it's a matter of discussion. So through through discussion, uh, really, uh, I think it's a value-based decision uh, that any group has to take. Is that you will commit right at the start uh, of your uh, working relationship that you're going to work collaboratively uh, for the best interests of the whole, and then. Um, uh, and sure, there will be battlegrounds uh, as we go through this, much as there was during that discussion about uh, 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 the gas tax program, um, where we couldn't come up with any regionally significant programs. I know we, we talked about trails and we talked about a few other things that could have been regionally significant, um, but that's a tough decision to make when an incorporated community has a sewer line that's failing or a water line that needs to be built. So. Um, those are the types of things that uh, we have to uh, take into account. So, uh, we, and the reason that we bring this up is that, uh, again, uh, we're into strategic planning season. Because we're a, a, on a calendar year, as all local governments are, and we're talking about uh, what comes up from our staff when we do our SWOT exercise, always as a weakness, uh, through ours is uh, our, our, is a staff concern about sort of parochialism and how we deal with larger programs when uh, uh, we're worried about each individual uh, constituency. So, um, and I and I'm sure that that uh, enters into the minds of the elected officials as well as what is what is the most beneficial? What's the big picture, long term best solution? for this regional district. Because, I mean, we know that uh, what is good for any of those 15 jurisdictions is good for everybody. You, you, don't, you don't make something better by uh, uh, defeating uh, needs of some other region that we're so closely involved with. So that's uh, uh, the deal. Um, ah, where are we? So uh, I think I'm going to stop there, Madam Chair, and open it up for discussions or debate. Okay, I'll go to Director Roberts, please. Thank you. Oh. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> I don't find it challenging a lot of times to think globally, and I, and, I, and I like and support so many different interests in seeing that the global uh, good really does affect uh, my own citizens. The challenges that I always find is sometimes the disparity in regards to socioeconomics, and my that tends to be where um, I, I tend to fight or feel like I'm stuck in a corner because, again, something might be globally good, it might be great um, regionally, but a lot of times can the tax or lack of tax base that I have and the inability to expand on taxes due to being, whether or not it's socioeconomics, whether or not it's just that I have no industrial lands, et cetera, you know, those things pop up as a, as, as a concern because, yes, I could be looking down the line where I see a, a water situation coming and realize that that's going to put the, the local taxpayer um, right at the brink. But then if I go into something that's, let's say, more uh, about 
a positive social step in regards to a program but that will increase the taxes that might be just too much even though it's a really good idea socially and uh, globally so that's usually where I have my um, challenges okay thank you director Coyne senior I think I'm kind of on the same page that uh, Director Roberts is on in that I have 11 distinct communities in my area um, from extremely affluent communities to seven kilometers down the road to incredibly not affluent communities. And weighing the difference, um, the values that each of those communities have and the fact that in our area, um, the big bucks come from heavy industry, mining and logging. Um, we also have a very vibrant uh, tourism industry and a very small agricultural community. So trying to put all of those uh, different values and, and different problems in front of you, the, along with issues for the city of Penticton or Summerland or Kermius. It, it's not a difficult job, or not an easy job to do, but overall, at the end of the day, I sit here and I vote for things at every meeting that I personally don't agree with for our area, but for the overall of the valley. Um, it's the right thing to do and some days you go home and you kind of want to kick yourself but you just bite the bullet and say that was better for everybody in the big picture and that's not an easy thing to do so anyways we'll just carry on with as as we go and thank you okay, thank you for that director Coyne jr. thank you um, you know it's funny because in our neck of the woods you don't really have an option not to think globally. His 11 communities are serviced through my, my community. Um, part of uh, Director Roberts' communities are, are serviced through my community as well. So when we make decisions, we don't, even at a municipal level, we're not only thinking about what's best for us, it's what's best for the whole upper Similkameen, and then in some cases, what's best for Karamea. So when we're thinking economically, we think, what's best for our valley, what's best for all of us, because we're all gonna benefit at the end of the day from a stronger you know, um, decision that benefits all of us. And same thing as Director Coyne Sr. was just saying, you know, we come here and, and sometimes we vote for things that we don't always agree with, but it's for the best of the, of the overall um, community as, as the regional district. And you know, we're just talking about the uh, sterile in, uh, insect you know and it, it's funny you know we laugh about it but you know the reason I think we're not part of that is because we don't have fruit trees but as climate change changes our our valley you know I'm sitting here seriously thinking well what what is the should Princeton and maybe area H be having that discussion as to what where should we be looking at this in the future maybe not right now but in the future that might be an option because you know it's warmer and warmer and you know, people are being able to grow sometimes fruit trees that we've never been able to see before. So it's not we're we're, we're always out, but you know, there's always there's always a reason behind why historically those those things weren't added to our areas. But you know, we we are always thinking about those things down the road. Like what if? And I so I think you know that's a good representation of how the whole district works. Okay, thank you. I've got quite a list started here. Director Johansson, you're next. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I think it's really important that uh, everybody around this table take some time and go and visit the far reaches of our region. I know Director Canodal and I went out to Princeton and, and Director Canodal and uh, Bob Coyne Sr. spent some time looking at some of the issues out there and I got to spend some time with Spencer walking around town and talking about the issues there. I've spent some time with Manford and, and uh, you, you know, Suma Kordoff and, and John. And uh, I think you, until you go out there and actually see what's going on firsthand, you hear about it around the table here, you don't get the whole picture for sure. 
And making that little bit of effort to go out on a road trip and spend half a day with somebody is worth, is, is huge because you've kind of walked in their shoes to a certain extent. And I know, I know from my experience in, in life, having come from large municipal areas into rural areas, you, you have to walk that walk to understand what's going on. You can't just hear it and think you understand it. So spending some time visiting everybody, I think is, is really well worth it. Thank you. Director Bauer. Uh, yeah, so Samil Kameen, I think, as already was mentioned, we are used to uh, making uh, decisions uh, based on the welfare of the whole valley. And, you know, I, I always like to say that the Samil Kameen Valley actually is more than half of what makes up the regional district of Okanagan Samil Kameen with only 10,000 people. So uh, a good example where we're not part of it, and maybe someone else can tell me why, is the regional growth strategy. My guess is because we are so different. And uh, in terms of land use, it's over 90% is farming and ranching. At the other end, like Director Cohen said, uh, there is uh, mining, there is uh, forestry, uh, and other heavy industries. In our end, is more organic farming, tourism, wineries, that kind of thing. But we have a different land use, we have a different economy, and we have a a huge area with very uh, little population, but we are certainly used to uh, work together. And I think a lot of that attitude is brought to this board table. There's no doubt about it. Uh, some of the things, personally, I don't like, for instance, uh, transit. Uh, we pay into the transit, but we get very little benefit of it. Uh, we just talked earlier about this with Princeton. They pay almost all of the handy dart costs instead of the region pays for it, even so they are part of regional transit. So there are a lot of things that could be done better, but we're working on it. Okay, thank you. Director Vasilaki. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, I agree with most of what I hear around this table. And, um, when, uh, and, and I understand that the board here is actually the, the council of the, the, the rural areas, because you don't have your own council, so this is where you get the information and you demand whatever it is that your area needs. Um, me at the city of Penticton, um, I have 35,000 people that my council and I have to deal with. Um, and the, the main focus of our public at the city of Penticton is, and they always bring it forward, is fairness. How fairly are the municipalities treated within the regional district? And by fairness, what I'm talking about is the, the payments that are made uh, by the municipalities when we don't get the services out of the regional district that the rural areas get. But we pay a large portion of those services that they get. Um, and, and those, uh, um, you notice at the meetings that I don't speak very much when it concerns the regional area, the um, rural areas. I don't want to interfere in the way that they govern uh, their areas. I'm, I'm concerned with, with my people. And, you know, there used to be a, he's a, a, a muni um, provincial now, but uh, he was here for a long, long time as a chair of, of the the original district, and his main focus was, and he always preached that we have to think regionally. But in order to think regionally, everybody has to be treated equally in a fair and e equitable way. And, and that's where I'm coming from. And I hope the, um, my other three counselors that are sitting on this board have similar thoughts. Think regionally, but we have to be treated equitably at the same time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, oh, Director Roberts, go ahead. Uh, and this is a, a question, thanks to the chair. Um, I was just wondering in regards to, um, we talk about uh, the voting system, the amount that things are worth in regards to finances and different areas. Is a part of the process when they figured out 
regional areas, like the area, their, the, how their borders are set up? Is it in regard, was it looked at in regards to population? Was it looked at in regards to the p potential in regards to industrial resource to have a more fair and equitable, um, or let's say more, more equity between the different groups? Was that ever a part of the process? Or has it just been basically a, like just static lines on the map? It's just a question. So back in the early 60s, when uh, the regional district would have been formed, uh, I'm sure that the electoral boundary uh, commission that was probably established looked at population and uh, the culture of the citizens within a specific geographic area. Uh, they would have looked at geographic uh, factors uh, as to how easy it was to travel from one spot to another. Uh, there, uh, they would have looked at the uh, economic uh, stability of areas. There would have been a, a number of factors. Once those were established, then uh, I'd say there, there has been some really minor boundary adjustments uh, for some of the electoral areas, but uh, not very much. That would take a uh, a governance review, much as uh, we did with uh, Area D uh, before it was split into two, is that that would be a regulatory process. Okay, back to you, Bill. Okay, so because each member, each of our 19 members uh, is responsible for participating in the functioning of the board. I know we, uh, in most cases, as far as procedure goes, we load that onto the chair uh, as far as operating meetings, um, but really the operating and functioning of the board is responsibility of all 19. Uh, so uh, what we're gonna do now is ask you to fill in a self-assessment on uh, the board. We have done this um, incrementally, I'd, I'd say, or, or uh, 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 over the past uh, year. So we, we do have somewhat of a trend line. So uh, the idea is that you fill in your survey. Uh, I'll take your survey forms, put it onto some spreadsheets for you, and then I'll come back tomorrow and uh, we'll talk about the results. And always the benefit of this type of a process is not the statistical uh, figures that we'll get back, uh, but is the discussion that occurs when we talk about the competencies that it talks about in the survey. So um, uh, has everybody got a pen or a pencil? And everybody's so. got a survey form? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you cannot leave the room until I get your survey back. <laughs> uh, for those that are joining us electronically, I believe that uh, Christy has made arrangements uh, with how you're going to get your surveys in uh, so that we can include you. But uh, if not, I mean, certainly when we get into the discussion tomorrow afternoon and talk about the board, uh, that would be the opportunity for... Uh, involvement anyway. And always keep in mind that what we're looking at here is opportunities for improvement. How can we make it a better functioning or more efficient uh, or more enjoyable experience for the board members around the table? So go. Okay, and just uh, Christy, let me know. I missed Director Knodal. He had a hand up. So Director Knodal, do you still have a question or comment or? On the, on the idea of what's good for the area versus the mm -hmm. region, uh, there's also a matter of opinion or we wouldn't have different political parties. <laughs> Look at things that uh, uh, I consider uh, damaging to an area that may be good for another area. Uh, you know, an example being is, is uh, on this opinion thing is, is Director Vasilaki's opinion on, on what Penticton paid and my opinion on what they don't pay. Uh, these opinions are, all, are going to be different for sure. And, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the picture of government. It's that your point of view is different and it taints or, or colors how your perspective works. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, and after this survey, is there one more, Bill? So fill in your survey, hand them in, take a break, and at three o'clock, come back for the inaugural meeting. Okay, thank you.
situation and because we do have some members uh, attending electronically, uh, we're going to give uh, an electronic voting system a try and uh, you should have received uh, a voting mechanism. I'm not sure what we call those, but uh, uh, <laughs> a voting structure thing. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Francisco and he's going to take you through it and then we'll give it a try before we actually get into the election. No, no. There we go. There was a, um, in person, one of these, it's an audience response device. <laughs> so a responder, that's what this is. If it isn't on, there's a power button in the bottom left. It's a sort of a circle with a line through it. You can press that once and it should turn on. I see two people have actually voted already. Uh, we have a live <laughs> vote here going on right now. Did yep. they vote for you? <laughs> I, I didn't put my name on there unless I'm one of oh, them. For, yeah. But yeah, once it turns on, it's ready. Whenever there's an active poll, so what's going to happen during the meetings is once this is up and asking for your vote, that's when this is active. It really doesn't respond otherwise. So, uh, you, you know, playing with it doesn't do anything. And what it will do is um, it'll take the last uh, vote that you choose. So you may start off with a, I want uh, Bugs Bunny, and I push A, then I decide, and it shows a, an A now on my screen that I've chosen uh, Bugs Bunny. But I think before the polling's over, I decide and change, and uh, I'm, Elmer Fudd is more of my liking, so I change it to two now. So you can continue to change what your answer is up until we actually say polling is finished, and then we close it off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait till we get to about 19 here, or 20, because I did a vote as well. <laughs> And we'll know that all of them are in. And Mr. Canole. Huh? <laughs> up to 17. 18. Is he having any issues? 18. Yep, yeah. go ahead and vote. We got 19. Great. 20, there we go. So everyone's voted. Yeah, so we're going to do a countdown. Five, you got three, two, one. All right, voting's done. And uh, we'll see what happened here. Wow. <laughs> That's our instant tabulation. So we'll be seeing those results here. Um, I'm just showing you everyone that will have an instant uh, nobody uh, res Daffy Duck. response to those. I guess nobody really likes Daffy Duck. <laughs> Uh, interesting group, but uh, that's all it is. After? Yeah. As do? soon as yeah. we end this uh, vote, then the devices become inoperable and we'll bring up the next vote. So we'll do this for the RDOS vote and then the hospital uh, direct uh, vote as well. So there's two separate votes that we'll bring through this uh, and any ties or vice chair and chair. So that's how it works. Really simple. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. So we're going to shortly open uh, nominations for chair. Uh, uh, this is uh, this should be familiar with uh, members we're now. We're going to go through this. We'll we'll ask for nominations. Uh, I'll need a seconder for the nomination. I'll ask uh, the nominee if they're prepared to accept the nomination, and then uh, I'll ask a second time and a third time. Uh, and if no further nominations are received, then we'll close off nominations. Each of the nominees will get three minutes to present their case to the board, uh, and we'll do that in the order that they were nominated in, uh, to be fair. And then uh, we'll do our electronic voting. The votes uh, will be uh, secret. So they'll go into uh, only Danny's computer. You won't see the results uh, on the screen. And uh, uh, prior to that, we'll appoint two scrutineers uh, who will, uh, at that point, just take the electronic numbers <laughs> off the computer and secretly give it to me, and I will announce uh, the winner. <laughs> <Secret>. <laughs> if uh, there does happen to be um, more than two, 
nominees, then uh, we'll do a vote. So if somebody doesn't get 50% of the vote, uh, we'll knock off the bottom, uh, uh, the, the recipient with the least number of votes, and we'll do another vote and until we can get somebody with uh, over 50% of uh, the members. Okay. All right. Uh, I will now declare nominations for the position of chairperson for the regional district open. Director Coyne. Carla. Uh, will you accept the nomination? I will. Okay. Uh, Director Monteith. I'd like to, re um, oh, I'm sorry, nominate Director Holmes. Director Holmes, is there a seconder? Director Trainer, uh, will you accept the nomination? Thank you. Thank you. I'll call uh, for uh, second time for nominations for chair. I'll call a third time for nominations for chair of the regional district. Not seeing any further nominations, I'll declare nominations closed. Uh, we have two candidates, so uh, in the order of Director Kozakovich and Director Holmes, so I'll ask uh, Director Kozakovich uh, to go ahead and present for her three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have your timer? I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Can you hear me okay, or do you want... No, I think you better use your mic. <laughs> Thank you very much for the nomination and the opportunity to let my name stand for board chair for the Regional District Okanagan Similkameen for the upcoming year. I think many of you are aware that I've completed nine years now as an elected area director with the RDOS, and I'm proud to say that in the past nine years, I have never missed a board meeting. I have attended approximately 215 consecutive meetings, and I think that speaks to my commitment as an elected official working on behalf of the citizens of our region. In my fourth and fifth year here at the board, I was nominated to be board chair, and I did decline those nominations as I wanted to be certain I had the time to commit to the role as well as the necessary experience. 2017 and 2018 certainly were challenging years for our region due to extensive flooding and fires. And we had declarations of local emergency in both of those years for extended periods of time, for, for many months. And I think it was the first time in the history of the RDOS that we actually had all of our electoral areas under a declaration of local emergency at the same time. And I always made myself available to the Emergency Operations Center staff, the public, and the press. 2020 has certainly been challenging as well. We started with COVID-19 and a transition to electronic meetings. We had a ransomware attack, which impacted our use of emails and the computer systems at the RDOS. And of course, we had the devastating Christie Mountain wildfire. Many of our citizens were under evacuation order, and we saw the tragic loss of a home. We know that COVID-19 will be with us into 2021, but we don't know what else is to come. You can count on my commitment and experience, and I feel that I am really prepared to lead you through challenging times, and I ask for your vote as board chair for the upcoming year. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, nominated. Uh, I'm proud to be associated with a political, uh, political organization that um, actually allows its members to nominate uh, candidates. <laughs> uh, first, I'd like to uh, say I don't think our residents really care who chairs the RDOS board. More important to them is their local representative, uh, the person they voted for. As chair, I'd always keep that in mind. I would keep it in mind when looking at our budgets, 
when working with our member municipalities, and re when reviewing board policies, such as our communications policy, and whether or not the chair should automatically be the primary spokesperson. For issues of a local nature, I think people primarily want to hear from their local representative. To support the people of the region, the chair needs to support those who the people elected. So if I'm sitting with you in a meeting, with staff, or with a lobby group, for example, I'll be in your corner. I'll be there to advocate for you and the board, not anyone else. The way the regional district is structured, with each of us representing our very unique communities, we sometimes find ourselves competing against each other. We compete for staff time, we compete for grant funding, for establishing priorities, that sort of thing. So it's important the chair establishes fairness in the process and, and ensures everyone has equitable access to information and knowledge. It's important the chair is impartial and has no vested interests. To that end, as chair, I would leave my Summerland hat in Summerland and wear only my regional hat. That means at the RDOS table, I wouldn't involve myself in any matter directly relating to Summerland. I've spoken with my fellow Summerland councillors about this, and they're okay with it. They understand that to be chair, I need to work for the common good of the region, and they know Director Trainer is more than capable of looking out for Summerland. <clears throat> All of us here in this room have made a commitment to public service, and we each contribute in our different ways. I personally feel I have more to give. As a municipal director, I know I don't shoulder the same responsibilities as a rural director. As a municipal councillor, I know I don't shoulder the same responsibilities as a mayor. In other parts of the province, including uh, central Okanagan, it's common for municipal councillors to pull their weight by serving as the regional district chair. I feel I can contribute in the same way. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, so we'll thank our two candidates uh, for giving their uh, colleagues uh, an indication of what they might expect uh, for the vote. So uh, what we need to do now is point, uh, point two scrutineers, uh, and that would be Christy Malden and Jillian uh, uh, Cram. So uh, we'll do that. Uh, and now, take your handheld voting devices uh, in hand. Okay, and you can see your two choices on the screen. And uh, vote now, please. Um, sorry, I can't. My mic's not working. Should I go back again? Yeah, my mic is not working. Turn it back on again. I think you have to turn it back on. Is it on? Turn it off. Okay, our expert will assist. <clears throat> Mine won't work either. I'm going to turn it off and on. I'll turn it off and on. <laughs> Yours not working? Um, Did you use the word, John? Yeah. Mine's not. Oh, there we go. Hold it. Still hasn't cleared? Okay. Hold it down. Okay. So now I've got to turn it on. I know, no, I did the same thing. It's on now? Okay, thank you. Can you see a little pencil at the top? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I like that. And then press yes. Okay, we should have one more. Uh, I think it's Rick online. I'm not sure mine is working. Oh, Katie? Yeah. Would Rick's telephone there? Yes. Good. Okay, so that should be everybody. Uh, anybody that has not been able to record a vote? Okay, yeah. So we've got the 19. So uh, we'll now turn that over to our scrutineers and they can give us the results. Okay. 
and, and as we mentioned, with two candidates, a simple majority uh, will determine the winner. So I can announce that the RDOS chair for 2021 is Carla Kozakovich. Okay. And just a reminder uh, that uh, uh, unsuccessful candidates for the uh, election of chair are eligible to put their name forward for vice chair. Okay. So. Uh, having completed that, we'll now open nominations for the position of Vice Chair of the Regional District. I'd like to nominate Director Monteith, please. Is there a seconder for that, for Director Monteith? Yes. Uh, Director Monteith, would you allow your name to stand? Thank you very much. Uh, other nominations for the position of Vice Chair, Director Bauer. I'd like to nominate Director Spencer Coyne. Is there a seconder for that? Thank you. Uh, Director Coyne, you'd allow your name to stand? I will. Thank you. Are there other nominations for the position of Vice Chair? I'll call a second time. Nominations for Vice Chair? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll nominate Director Holmes. Is there a seconder for Director Holmes? Thank you. Director Holmes, would you allow your name to stand? Uh, no, I think I'll give somebody else the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll call another third time for nominations for uh, vice chair. See no further nominations. I will declare uh, the nominations for vice chair closed. So uh, we have two members. Uh, running for the position of vice chair, Director Monteith and Director uh, Spencer Coyne. So uh, take your electronic voting things in hand. Uh, have we got that up on the screen, Danny? Did we get to speak, Phil? Did we get oh, to speak? Oh, sorry. Did you did you each want two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we'll do this in the order of nomination. So, Director Monteith. Alrighty, well, I appreciate the nomination, Director Vasilaki. Um, this is my third year of my four-year term, and I uh, want to share a bit about where I, you know, where I started. So I've grown up in the Okanagan area, uh, started in Okanagan Falls, I graduated from Oliver. I've spent many years um, in the South Okanagan, um, lived in Penticton, I've lived in Carameas, I've lived in Cleden for, since 2004. So my background um, with my family and myself has always been in agriculture, natural resources, mining, tourism. I've um, just in the process of completing my business administration degree in human resources. So when I decided to get into politics, it sort of followed, uh, I guess, my previous careers. and. Um, I took a, a year coming to regional district meetings and got used to the system and tried to learn how things happened before I took this well, important role. So I've used that um, process in all my decision making and I make sure that I research everything, I talk to subject matter experts, I'm also making sure that we're looking at decisions regionally. And I've seen many gaps where we can do, do better together where we haven't been. And I'd really like to work on working together. So that's something I would work towards. Transparency is important. Um, collaborative decision making and building a team. I feel that the regional district at times were so separated and coming together as a team and looking at regional projects is really important to me. Um, I wanna focus on communication, building fairness into decision making, um, adding value added benefits to all of our services um, working on economy of scale, I see opportunities to work together that we're not utilizing, and it's important to me. Um, I 
this would be an important role, something that I see as a, a support to the chair. Um, anytime I could be there to support the chair, fellow directors would be critical to making sure that we're working together as a team, a collective team. So I ask for your support and um, I look forward to hopefully working with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Monteith. Director Coyne. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm honored. <laughs> I'm electric. <laughs> I'm, I'm honored for this opportunity. Um, today I'm running for vice chair because I believe the chair and vice chair should be representative of the board. With the chair from the more populated end of the valley, I believe the vice chair should represent the more rural parts of the, of the district. The, re Oops. the regional district has seen an increasing number of emergencies like fires and floods over the years. I have first-hand experience with these types of events in the upper Samokamin Valley. This, is a, this will allow me to support the chair if and when these types of events happen. In many instances, when there has been an emergency in the Okanagan, there is one in the Samokamin at the same time. By having a chair from the Okanagan, a vice chair from the Samokamin, it allows the regional district to have a voice and communication across the district at these trying times. It is important that the chair and vice chair can work together and that the vice chair can support the chair when needed. It is also important that there is a representative from the more rural parts of the district. And it's hard to get more rural than our end of the valley. <laughs> For me, when looking at the chair and the vice chair, these two positions must be held by individuals who believe that together the regional district is stronger. I ask that you, you vote for me for the next vice chair of the regional district of Okanagan Similkameen. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Director Coyne. So now take your electronic voting devices in hand. And there we go. We have uh, Director Monteith and Director Spencer Coyne. So uh, feel free to vote. Mine's not working. Not working? <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> One more to go. There we go. Okay, seeing 19 on the boards, then we'll turn it over to our scrutineers. Okay. And uh, typically in the past, we've asked uh, that ballots be destroyed. Uh, I guess in this case, we'd ask them to be deleted uh, following, of course, the recording of the vote. No. Okay, and then after the election, I'll turn it over to you. So we can proclaim that the vice chair for the regional district of Okanagan and Samuel Kameen for 2021 will be Spencer Coyne. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Directors, have a look at your agendas, please. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Moved, seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. So we're going to go straight to item D on the agenda. Legislative Services D1, 2021 RWS Schedule of Meetings. CAO. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So it's a regulatory requirement that uh, the regional district 
advertise uh, meetings in advance, and we've always found it most convenient to uh, uh, vote on our schedule of meetings uh, at the start of the year. So that's what this is, and uh, Madam Chair, we've presented a, a schedule of meetings for uh, 2021, and we're looking for a motion. Okay, thank you. Moved by Director Bauer, seconded by Director Coyne Jr. Are there any questions or concerns with that schedule? Okay, not seeing any. It's a corporate vote. I'll call the question. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Carried. Thank you. We'll go to D2. 2021 Advisory Planning Commission Schedule of Meetings, CAO. Uh, uh, same for the Advisory Planning Commissions, Madam Chair, is that we're required to uh, provide a, a notice of meetings, and it's uh, always been beneficial for us to do that at the start of the year. So we are recommending that we adopt that 2021 meeting schedule. Okay, thank you. Moved by Director Coyne Sr. Is there a seconder? Director Pendergraf, thank you. Any questions? Yes, Director Monteith. To the chair, um, I believe area I had asked us to do a later start time than 5.30. I believe they were looking at 7 p.m. Okay, so we could amend that to be mm -hmm. 7 p.m. Great, thank you. Anybody else with a suggestion or question? Okay, once again, a corporate vote. I'll call the question, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we'll go to D3, 2021 Regional District Signing Authority, CAO. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So again, an annual requirement uh, is that we appoint signing authorities for the board, and we are recommending um, that it be the chair and vice chair as the signing authority. What are you squinting at? Oh, you're trying to read my note. <laughs> yeah, we're okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. We're looking for a motion to appoint the chair and vice chair, Director Bauer, Director Robinson. Any questions? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. And the last item, D4, 2020 November schedule of board meetings, CAO. Yeah, we thought we'd add this on. It's, it's a busy time of year for us, and then with the COVID requirements and having to move off site, uh, that we make sure that uh, the board members have placeholders in their calendars for this. So, uh, of course, today and tomorrow, we have for our legislative workshop and inaugural meetings. Next Thursday, we'd like to do our strategic planning with you. And then on Friday, we want to do our initial meeting uh, for the budget committee. So uh, that is the 12th and 13th. And then uh, we'll continue on um, with budget on the 20th. And of course, the 19th is our second regular meeting in November. Uh, other than that, uh, we did have a, a tentative date for November 26th, um, Madam Chair, and we don't believe that we'll need that. So. Uh, we'll put this where we don't need a motion on this. We just wanted to put it forward for information. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Did anyone have any questions or comments on that schedule? Uh, yes, Director Gettens. Thank you to the chair. I'm just curious about moving forward in 2021 and about meeting in person again. And I recognizing that we did this quite successfully today. And um, I just wanted to make sure that somehow that's in the works. I think it's been really great seeing everybody and having the energy in the room and sharing some conversation again. So I'm curious about if we are still working towards more regular in-person meetings beyond strategic planning. So we're going to continue to provide electronic access. Uh, for one thing, that's been one of the benefits of uh, uh, managing through the pandemic is that uh, we do have electronic access now for members and the public uh, uh, at board meetings. With the uh, public health officer's order um, that enables us to close meetings to the public, uh, we are now looking at whether we can get board members uh, back in. We certainly would not, in our boardroom, have room for uh, the 19 members of the board, staff, and public. Uh, but with the 
Uh, ministerial order, I think we're all right on that. Um, we expect that to continue into 2021. We're looking currently at uh, plexiglass shields in between chairs. We don't have room uh, in order to get that six feet uh, between members uh, in the boardroom, but we're looking at different options. Um, and certainly uh, we're consulting with other regional districts uh, as to what they're doing as well. So uh, we're working on that. Okay, thank you. Director Coyne Jr. Yeah. I was just curious how much this costs today. Oh. <laughs> uh, it costs us probably, um, just for everything in here, it's probably 2000 okay. Is that per day or is that for the two days? That's each day. Each day. Wow. Three thousand? Yeah. Three thousand, yes. So we'll have to consider that as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Director Gettins. Oh, Director Gettins, go ahead, please. Remember, off the top of my head, but we had some numbers that were presented that weren't three thousand dollars a day to hold meetings in somewhere else, right? Like the I know the Trading Convention Center was one, but we had a few other options too, right? That aren't quite as expensive. I'll uh, go to Miss Molden. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Director Coyne Sr. I'm quite comfortable with the uh, online meetings for our regular board meetings. Okay, so. thank you. And anybody else with a comment? Director Holmes? I just think that we're in this for the long run and um, while um, the online meetings are convenient and can work most of the time. I, I don't see it really being um, very good for government governance in the long run. And I think we need to find a solution. And whether that's like putting plexiglass between our, our um, between each station in in the boardroom or or something like that, we we'll, we'll need to solve this within the next year because I don't think. Um, I don't think it's just going to disappear, and we're going to have to learn to live with it. So, okay, thank you. Yes, Director McCordoff, go ahead, please. That we need to likely compromise on this, and if there is a possibility, occasionally to uh, to meet in person. I certainly appreciate that, seeing everybody today, but I do think that we need to follow the guidelines and uh, meet electronically 90% of the time or something like that, so I'm okay with that. Okay, thank you. Sorry, who's? Oh, Director Knodel, my apologies. Go ahead, please. I think we need to lead by as nice as these meetings may be for everyone, you're dealing with a disease that can kill people. Uh, and the public health people are advising that you limit contact. And I don't think it shows a good example if we look for a way to get around it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Director Gettins. Chair, just to be clear, I'm not looking for a way to get around anything. I'm assuming we're following all the guidelines here today. So that's what I'm looking forward to. And I don't know if all of the municipal um, members now you're meeting in person. I don't know if anybody else is still continuing meeting electronically for our municipal members. Or is everybody meeting in person somehow? Go ahead, Director McCordoff. Um, we do meet, uh, uh, some people do it electronically on our council, mm -hmm. and some meet there. We have agreed that the chairperson of the meeting needs to be there in person. Okay, that's good. Okay. Okay, I think just you. again, just really quickly, just as, a, as some of the difference for rural directors, this is mm -hmm. still our only table, and I, I do miss it. Like, I do miss talking to staff really quickly. I miss checking in with everybody, and I do think that I do a better job in the role when I'm here in person. So... 
just to reiterate, not looking to skirt anything, definitely follow the public health officer's orders, but if we are working towards doing that, then we should, because this isn't gonna go away soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Director Sentis, did I see a hand up there? Well, I was just... <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was just thinking, uh, uh, Director Gettens asked what the, uh, what the municipality is doing, and, and I wondered if you knew that in Penticton, we started off virtually for sure, um, and then um, more recently, and John, you can correct me, um, we have gone back to in-person. Uh, we were able in the confines of our council chambers, uh, physically distance, um, and uh, we just had a desire to be back together. So we're following all the protocols of distance uh, with masks, with the sanitization of the hands, but we are back in chambers. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, obviously, we're going to be greater challenged. We're more than double the size of a regular council, but we'll see what we can do moving forward and, and try and do a mix of both uh, virtual and in person if we can. Any further comments or suggestions? Uh, just that we'll get an options paper up to committee uh, as soon as possible, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Yes, Director Obrick. Uh, yes, and thank you. And uh, I support meeting in person, but you know, for those who don't want to, I, I like the idea of they can join in uh, mm -hmm. by the uh, electronic device. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Director Bauer. Yeah, so just quickly, we do meet in person too, but our council meetings are not six hours. They're just, you know, an hour to two. And uh, we do offer our community hall for uh, community groups, uh, specifically in November when everybody has so many AGMs. And I'm wondering if the city of Penticton may want to offer something too, like the convention center, to save the taxpayers money for good governance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Director Roberts? I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to the chair. Um, I like that I, as we're moving forward, um, I like the fact that we're putting more um, emphasis on technology. And I think that's going to be the real caveat, the, the importance in regards to listening. Like when we do web, uh, when we're operating like uh, Director Canodal, when everybody's might, you can hear it a lot better when you're at home and when you're using the headsets, et cetera. And, and I think being in a, in a forum, even if we're together, if we were uh, appropriately mic'd, et cetera, I think it's gonna be that much better. And I think it's something that then works on both sides of it because mm -hmm. sometimes we miss it even in person. Great, thank you. Uh, Director Bush? Yeah, I'm just wondering if we could get Director Knodel to upgrade his internet or something, because <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear what he has to say, but uh, it, it's all broken up. Thank you. Thank you. Director Coyne, Jr. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the town of Princeton, we've never did the online thing, because we had a big enough space for our council to fit into, but we don't have any, any guests in our council chambers, because it's not big enough for that. Um, and we also have to restrict how many staff members come to our council meeting. So we've kind of gone to a uh, hybrid where we have people call in and, and do the video thing. But we've also just recently started doing community of the whole meetings where we'll have delegations come to us at a community hall um, separate. And we only allow one, one speaker come in because we don't have the space for, for more. But they can have one speaker come in and then we have time to clean the podium and, and everything afterwards. But it's, it's a real challenge, and I understand. I mean, I, I love being here. I haven't, I barely left town since this has started, and I love seeing everybody, but we have, you know, we do have to be careful, and we have to keep in mind the cost as well, right? I mean, $3,000 a day is a, is a lot of money, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I understand your, your concerns. We, we, we do have to find some solution that fits everybody, right? Thank you, Director Johansson. Yes, there we go. I'll weigh in as well. Uh, we are meeting in person in Oliver. We did move to the Benevolence Theatre after a series of Zoom meetings, and now we're actually going to be moving back into our council chambers. Uh, we're looking at this as probably two more years at least. I don't know when the... I saw an interesting article on the internet 
when is this going to end? How are we going to know that this is over? And I don't think there's going to be a date when it's suddenly over. We're going to have to learn to adapt with it. And uh, I think finding some kind of a hybrid model where we've got Zoom meetings going on and we're meeting in person, and maybe as we move further down that road, we might be able to meet in person more often as opposed to Zoom meetings. But I think at some point we have to move in, in that direction probably slowly, take it, take it cautiously as the, uh, there does seem to be a bit of a second wave coming uh, or happening out there, even interior health is getting more numbers, but uh, looking down the road, uh, we're in this for the long haul, I think. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, not seeing any other comments. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Move, seconded, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to CIO Newell. So we'll convene the uh, Regional Hospital uh, District Board meeting. And uh, again, the first item on the agenda will be the election of the executive officers. Uh, we'll follow the same script uh, that we did with uh, uh, the Regional District. Um, so I will now declare nominations open for the position of chair for the regional hospital district. Director Coyne. I will nominate you, please. Is there a seconder for Director Sentis? Yes. Uh, Director Sentis, would you accept the nomination? Thank you. I'll call a second time for nominations for the position of chair. Uh, sorry. Oh, Director Knodel, I'm sorry. I nominate Martin Johansson. <laughs> was, was that Director Johansson you nominated? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, <laughs> is there a seconder for Director Johansson? Yes, thank you. Director Johansson, would you accept the nomination? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very much. I'll call a third time for position of chair for the regional hospital district. And a final time, just to make sure. Uh, seeing no further nominations for the position of chair of the regional hospital district, I will declare nominations closed. And we will give each member three minutes to present uh, their platform, and we will go in the order of nominations. Director Sentes. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the nomination. I've been a City of Penticton Councillor for 12 consecutive years, and previously have been a multi-year member of this RDOS as well as a former vice chair of the Okanagan Similkameen Regional Hospital District. I have actively lobbied and supported advocacy strategies to both IHA and MOH for the health needs and services to the people of our region from birth to school age, as well as seniors. I was a member of the team who presented to then Minister of Health, Terry Lake, our proposal for the expansion of the Penticton Regional Hospital. As one of the leads in that success, I learned much about provincial health strategies. Together with the then Usher Chair, Michael Bryden, we insisted that IHA make presentations to our Usher Board for budget and significant updates and not simply send email notifications. We also identified our disapproval for a budget adjustment that changed monies allocated for children's services at PRH to a financial situation in psychiatry. We successfully reversed that action. We must focus our energies on reminding IHA that the region includes areas south of Kelowna, like Oliver, Osuyas, Karameas, and Princeton, for example. And those residents have needs and provision of services. I would like to lead these, those initiatives as the Osher Board Chair and appreciate your consideration of my nomination. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Sintas. Uh, Director Johansson.
thank you, CAO. Uh, thank you to the board for the nomination. It's definitely an honor. And I would also like to thank you for this opportunity to share the f a few of the reasons with you why I would like to be your chair for the hospital district. We've all benefited from the, from the work of the hospital board, whether it's a brand new tower at Penticton Regional Hospital, the recent renovations to the emergency department at South Okanagan General Hospital, or everyday items such as new equipment uh, for the various healthcare facilities in the Okanagan Smilkameen. Something you probably don't know about me is I have been very busy over the last few years working on committees and attending workshops, learning about the issues affecting rural health care in our region and our province. And some of those activities would include the SOS Rural Health Care Community Coalition, local government primary care engagement workshops, or the Oliver Asuyas PCN Advisory Committee. I've also been busy working with local doctors, working and building relationships with local doctors and interior health as the hospital liaison for the town of Oliver. And if I've learned anything, warranted or not, there is a lot of angst amongst many South Okanagan Smilkameen residents who fear that their timely access to healthcare is in jeopardy as they see centralization of hospital services on the horizon. Now all of our communities are unique and we face our own challenges, but I believe electing a hospital district chair from the South Okanagan would be a very strategic move on behalf of the board. It would be a tangible demonstration that timely and equal access to health care, regardless of where you live, is important to us. And in addition, we believe that our rural communities deserve the same level of care and resources as our more urban areas do. Now, as a way of demonstrating my level of commitment to and involvement in rural health care issues over the last while, I brought along today with me three letters of endorsement. These are all people that I have had the pleasure of working with since being elected mayor for the town of Oliver. The first is from the Executive Director of South Okanagan Clinical Operations Acute and Community, Mr. Carl Meadows from Interior Health. The second is the Chief of the Suez Indian Band, who also happens to be the Tribal Chair for the Okanagan Nation Alliance, Chief Clarence Louie. And finally, the last is a local family doctor GP that works out of a clinic in Oliver who also puts time in at the emergency department at South Okanagan General Hospital, Dr. Mattia Smallwood. For anyone that's interested, I have these references here for your, your perusal today if you would like. And in conclusion, I'd like to say one more time, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and I respectfully ask for your vote to chair the hospital district for the following year. Thank you. Thank you, Director Johansson. So, uh, we'll get our voting platform up on the screen. Everybody has their voting things. Okay. All right, and the voting is now open. And we have only two members running, so again, a simple majority uh, will serve. <coughs> there we go. So we have 19 votes now recorded. So we'll wait for our scrutineer to indicate the winner. So we can declare that the chairperson for the uh, Okanagan Sunokamine Regional Hospital District for 2021 is Judy Sentes. Okay, and then just a reminder that uh, nominations for the position of vice chair are open to all members of the board, including those that ran for chair. So I will now open nominations for the position of Vice Chair of the Regional Hospital District. Director Pendergraf. I would nominate Director McCordoff. Is there a seconder for Director McCordoff? Yes, Director McCordoff, would you accept the nomination? 
Thanks. Uh, other nominations? Director Coyne? Oh, is Ryan, oh, you're Ryan pointing? has her hand up. Director Johansson. Director Johansson? Johansson. Is there a seconder for Director Johansson? Yes, Director One, Johansson, two. would you accept the nomination? Okay. Other nominations for the position of vice chair? I'll call a second time for nominations and a third time for nominations for vice chair. Uh, seeing no further nominations, I'll declare nominations closed and we will allow each of our nominees two minutes uh, to present their platform in the order uh, that they were nominated. Who was the first one nominated? Uh, Director McCortoff. Sorry, I, I just got your first initial. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for um, uh, for allowing me to uh, to run for this position. I have lived in the Okanagan for um, in Asuyas actually for over 50 years. I know I look young, but and at one point I was the uh, president of the hospital auxiliary. That was way back. I was also the chair of the South Okanagan General Hospital and was on that board from uh, 1981 to 1997 when hospital boards were um, were declared defunct and they became hospital districts. So I have a long background in that. I've also been very happy to be on the developing sustainable rural practice committees, communities, which was then changed to the South Okanagan Similkamine Rural Healthcare Community Coalition. And I've been on that and attended meetings once a month in Karamea since 2015. Um, with that, I was very happy to, sh uh, to find share ideas from my point of view, plus the other rural communities that um, particularly Oliver, Asuyas, Karameas, and Princeton. And I, we all, I think, learned a lot from that. We're very adaptable, learned from each other, and I think it was a very good way to get um, involved. I've also been on the local government primary care engagement workshops that have been held in Penticton for the last couple of years. And again, it was um, coming together and talking specifically about health issues. And also the Oliver Asuyas Primary Care Network Committee. So I do think I have a good background in this. I think it's important to have rural representation. And um, so I ask for your vote in this uh, position. Thank you. Thank you, Director McCortoff. Director Johansson. Thank you. I probably can't redo my speech because I only got two <laughs> minutes. And it was a three-minute job, so. <laughs> anyway, um, something else that I think you should take into consideration is that um, I spent a lot of my life living up in West Bank, Kelowna, working 20 years for the city of Kelowna, and then moving to Oliver, it was definitely an eye-opener to move down to a rural community and start to deal with some of the issues that's affecting South Okanagan General Hospital. Um, that is a real concern in our community, and today I heard some news, still wait to be confirmed, that we may have lost another doctor, a significant figure in the community. I tell you, we are in trouble. I don't know if we're going to be able to keep our emergency department open. And I would like to be on this as the vice to make sure that we're looking after our citizens in the South Okanagan, and particularly Oliver, which services everybody south of Oliver. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Johansson. So we'll get the voting platform up on the screen. Okay, and voting is now open. I think you just gotta hold the off for an extended period and then turn it back on.
Uh, anybody having trouble with their machines? Uh, Director Holmes? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we'll consider voting closed and we'll ask our scrutineers to uh, let us know who the successful candidate for vice chair is. I can't hear you. Oh, okay. So we can proclaim uh, Director McCortoff as the vice chair of the hospital district. Okay. So uh, with your new name tag there, uh, Chair McCortoff, you can consider yourself as chair, but we won't be moving. Judy. Judy's chair. Oh, sorry, uh, Vice Chair is McCordoff. So we'll talk it over this way. So uh, with your new name, <laughs> uh, we'll just turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Newell. I will call the, uh, the Osher meeting to order. Um, oh, I guess that's you. Are you gonna do that? No, that, that would be you. That, oh, it says you online. Yeah, and I'll just turn it over to you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> We'll get this organized. Um, I will acknowledge the election of the 2021 Osher Board Chair and Vice Chair, uh, and will ask for the approval of the agenda. Good, thank you. Uh, all in favor of that motion? Thank you. Um, the item D is legislative issues, and uh, that says refer to CAO. Thanks, Madam Chair. So again, by regulation, uh, we have an obligation to advertise the meetings of the uh, Board of Directors for the Regional Hospital District, and we do that at the start of the year. So uh, we have made a recommendation on a schedule of meetings, Madam Chair, and we would uh, recommend that. Are there any concerns or issues with the um, agenda that's, uh, pardon me, with the schedule? Seeing none, then I will call the uh, the motion. All in favor? Thank you very much. Um, item uh, D2 is signing authority for Osher. Um, and again, CAO, if you would, please. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So we recommend that the board chair and board vice chair be the signing authorities for the regional hospital district. Thank you. So that motion would include myself as the board chair and uh, Director Sue McCordov as the vice chair. Are there any questions about the motion? I will call that motion then. All in favor? Thank you. Um, and item E is adjournment. So with that, I will call the meeting to an end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So before everybody leaves, uh, I understand that we do want to get a picture uh, of the board, so please uh, hang around. I, I suppose uh, Ms. Malden will uh, organize you. And then uh, um, thanks very much for your attention during the day. I know it uh, can turn into a long day sometimes. Uh, we will do this again tomorrow morning, so same schedule starting at 9 o'clock, uh, but we do commit to try and get you out of here by 3. Thanks, everybody.